good evening. Thank you all for coming. My name is Rhys Janot. I'm on the editorial team and one of the directors at Activism Munich. I'm sure you're all eager to get on tonight's discussion, but with your permission, I would first like to make a few thank yous on behalf of Activism Munich. First of all, thank you very much to Dietmar Lupfer and the Moffettwerk team for providing us with the space to hold this event. It's a delight to once again be in the Moffetthalle. We'd like to thank Patrick Knodel of the Knodel Foundation and Antona Schwarz of the Gorilla Foundation for your continued financial support. The funds they have provided have not only helped us grow and develop as an organization, but have also helped to bring about this event. Initiative gegen Totalüberwachung, thank you as well for your financial support. They do a lot to make the public aware of their privacy rights, initiating petitions, organizing demonstrations, and the like. Thank you to Human Connection for your financial support. Human Connection's aim is to be a real online social network and a non-profit alternative to Facebook. Thank you to Mehr Demokratie e.V. and Münchner Friedensbundnis for your publishing and networking support. Mehr Demokratie actively campaigns for the right to hold federal referendums at the, and, national, and, sorry, and European referendums, among other things. Münchner Friedensbundnis challenges the arms industry, organizing demonstrations like the yearly Ostermarsch here in Munich. If you'd like to learn more about these organizations, please visit the info tables in the bar area or our, our info table in the foyer. Many thanks as well to Foyu for providing the food for our hungry team. I would also like to thank all our members, both former and current, for their donated time, without which none of this would be possible. So moving on. You in the audience should have found a guide to the evening on your seats. If you flip it open, you'll of course find the schedule to tonight's event. You will also find a crowdfunding brochure which summarizes our history and outlines the many, many, many ways in which you can donate to Activism Munich. Because we do not take money from advertising or governmental entities, it is important to emphasize that we rely on donations to fund our work. If you like what we do, want to support an independent media project such as ours, you can also do it with a cash donation. Again, please drop by our info tish um, and you'll find the box there. All donations are of course tax deductible and you will be provided with a receipt upon request. We are taking questions from the public and are providing slips of paper for that purpose. So please take some time during the break to write down your questions and pop them in the boxes of the guests you wish to ask. You'll also find them, of course, at our info table. Tonight's event will be dubbed in German and published alongside the English version on our website for free on the 8th of May. I would also like to remind you that after the event, we have set aside time for a networking opportunity, so please stick around and get to know us and some of the other organizations present tonight. You may take photos during the event, of course, but we ask that you kindly keep your flash off. So no flash, please. Also, please remember to switch your mobile devices to silent mode. So I'd like to leave off with some lyrics from the song, I Pity the Country, in German, kurz gesagt, ich, be ich bemitleide das Land by Willie Dunn, who was a First Nations Canadian folk singer. He was targeting his anger at the Canadian government for its oppression of Aboriginal peoples in Canada, which unfortunately continues to this day. So this is dedicated to oppressed peoples everywhere, particularly those who have suffered and continue to suffer at the hands of Western expansionism, Western capitalism, Western bombs, Western greed, so we can fill the holes in our souls with shit we don't need. So anyway, from Willie Dunn, 
Government is bumbling. Revolution is rumbling. To be ruled in impunity is tradition continuity. I pity the country. I pity the state and the minds of men who thrive on hate. So, with nothing further from me, can you please welcome to the stage our host for the evening, Sen Raza. Thank you, Reese. Thank you, Reese, for that wonderful introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming today. I'm your host and moderator of this evening today, Zan Raza, and I'll be ensuring that this ship goes smoothly. But before I start, I want to share a little thought that I had while I was biking on my way to this venue. And I think, like I saw on Facebook on, and on our email account, I saw that a lot of people are coming down from different cities, and obviously we're publishing this on YouTube on the 8th of May. But for those who don't know much about Munich, you know, Munich is a beautiful city, and I can spend hours admiring it. But essentially, there's a river that's called Isa, which is running right through the city, actually. And right across the river, there's a bike lane. And while I was biking on this lane, it's like 26 degrees, nice breeze, and I was getting into thoughts about the world and such. But the turning point happened at an intersection when I looked at a small shop. You call it kiosk, I guess. And I saw something very significant there. I mean, a rare sight, I would say. There was a nice, chilled-out beer lying there. And I thought to myself, wow, why don't I just grab that beer, Zan? You know, lie down at the Isa and just not come here. You know, what's stopping me from doing this? You know, and I, I, I pursued that thought a little further, and I thought about why 35 volunteers from France, from Canada, from all across Germany, uh, the United Kingdom, are coming down to put up the stage, to put up this design, to put up this live stream. Why, are, why is this happening? And if I pursue that thought a little further, I thought to myself, why are you guys here? Like, what are you guys doing here? So I came to the conclusion, it's the same conclusion I always do, it's nothing new, but anyways, I like thinking. So, and the conclusion was, the system isn't working. You know, look at it from any angle. Economics, we have more poverty than ever. Climate change, this planet might be inhabitable by 2050. 156, 165 million people will be migrating at that point to just flee climate change. We had one million people coming here, right? And there was this huge halupla, oh my God, all these foreigners. But think about 165 million people. So wars, nuclear threats, Donald Trump's Twitter account, and the list goes on and on and on, you know? So think about it this way. What if I was standing on stage right here at this exact same place and I was telling you, there's no nuclear weapons anymore on this planet. Wars have ended. Poverty is history. And would you guys be coming here with everybody? I'd probably be here talking to myself, people thinking I'm psychologically unstable. But long story short, I don't think we would, we would need to do this. We'd all be at the ESA, chilling and having a beer and probably spending time getting to know each other and uh, harnessing our creative endeavors. So I got on my back again and I realized why I'm doing what I'm doing and why so many people are interested, engaged in this organization and I made my way here. And these are the thoughts that went into this event. I'm not talking about the beer, I'm talking about the system, right? So this event, Global Issues and Context, is trying to find a different form of delivering information to you and to the international community. And if you think about the news cycle, you're bombarded every day with titsy bitsy information coming your way, uh, Trump tweeted this stuff, and this is going on, ISIS is over in another city, and uh, we have another war, chemical attacks. All of these things are given to you in a vacuum. And that's why we thought about how can we find a way where people just once in the year, at least minimum, find a way to engage, to get different sorts of information packaged together so they can understand that there's a system at function, and not just demonizing in another group or demonizing Trump. I'm not a big fan of Trump, but he's not responsible. This is a continuation that's been going on since a long, long time. And 
we also thought about like many people like are in defense. They're ignoring the news. They're ignoring politics. And it's like I think of it of as a goalkeeper who doesn't want to keep the goal. Like the ball's coming and you're just trying to get out of the way because you just don't want to get news because it brings you down. You know? And there's some people that absorb the news and think about ways of how to organize, discipline their lives and somehow engage in society and change the problems that we have today. Either way, whatever route you choose, you lose. The system has an upper hand. And so I think what is needed today, and this is what this event is trying to do, is not only provide you with context, which is filled with history, which is filled with comparisons, but also to leave you with a solution-oriented feel, to feel you inspired, to feel that you can change things in this society. And this is what we're trying to achieve today, that you guys go out today and feel like you can change the world tomorrow. Maybe there's some stuff that we talk about where you don't agree with us. Maybe you can compare it with other, what, however you choose to do it, this is the primary goal. So without further ado, I would like to thank you guys again. I hope this is going to be an informative and enjoyable evening for you. And I hope on the way back, I'll see you at the ESA with the beer. So without further ado, I would like to call upon my first guest, Abby Martin. Abby Martin is a visual artist and independent journalist. She is the founder of Media Roots, a board member of Project Censored, former host of RT's Breaking the Set, and creator and host of The Empire Files on Telesur. Ladies and gentlemen, Abby Martin. And what we're experiencing today where people are coming out uh, is almost every day in Cali. I mean, sometimes in San Francisco you have the fog, but in Germany as soon as the sun shines, everybody's <laughs> coming. A couple of people texted me today saying, Zen, I'm not going to come today because the sun is shining out. I'm like, okay, you know, I hope it shines forever. But anyways, that's why you're here. Let's find a solution to all the problems. You've been an activist, documentary maker. You've hosted Breaking the Set. You're at Telesur. You're on the streets. You've got so much experience in this field of journalism, activism. Talk about a little bit about your life journey. What inspired you? And where do you want to go with that? Well, Zen, uh, uh, like a lot of people, I didn't grow up politically conscious or politically astute. Uh, I kind of got a crash course in US imperialism uh, with Zinn, Chomsky, Chalmers Johnson when I was a freshman in college. And I was just astounded at the damage that the US empire has done. I mean, the violent economic oppression and military subjugation around the world. And so I was so alarmed. At the time, I still kind of blamed the Bush administration. I was trapped in that partisan mindset. Um, and then the media started selling us Iraq. You know, I was kind of swept up in that post 9-11 hysteria, bought into the Afghanistan war, didn't really understand how both parties were complicit until, of course, uh, Nancy Pelosi said impeachment was off the table for a war criminal who was committing war crimes. And the media just kind of uniformly switched one day over to selling us the WMDs. And I was just so disturbed. I thought, why is this happening? And through my anti-war activism, I realized that you need media for the people, right? Because it doesn't matter what your issue is. You could be passionate about GMOs. You could be passionate about the water supply, about war. As long as you don't have a free media, it doesn't matter. You can't get those issues out there. So I just uh, dove headfirst into um, media comprehension, media literacy, and really fighting for a free and open people's media for the people, by the people. And that's what started my journey today. It's very interesting because this journey kind of ended up at uh, the CIA or the Intelligence <laughs> Committee's table. <laughs> and in January 2017, they came up with this document called Assessing Russian Intentions in Recent U.S. Elections. They actually took their time, limited resources, despite all the poverty, to, to mention you in this document. This document basically was trying to find ways of showing how Russia interfered in the election. And since you worked at RT, you hosted the uh, show Breaking the Set, they mentioned you, and let me quote what they wrote, overwhelmingly focused on criticism of the US and Western media governments, as well as the promotion of content that is radical. So before you answer this question, I find it really funny 
because I think in our open and democratic society, if you're criticizing the Western government, isn't that something people should be welcoming? You would think so, Zen. Unfortunately, that's why a lot of anti-imperialist journalists like myself, like Chris Hedges, have to go to places like Russia today to provide that alternative, uh, you know, the counter-narrative to that corporate media hegemony that, that pushes imperialism down our throats. We were all waiting with bated breath for this intelligence report uh, for months. We were being told by the corporate media, by the establishment, you know, neoliberal establishment and intelligence agencies that they were going to come out with this conclusive proof that Russia meddled in the election. And so we were all waiting for this report. Unfortunately, when it came out, I was stunned. I was stunned that I was in it. <laughs> I was a part of the reason why um, Trump won. Because half of the report, Zen, was about, it was a crude analysis about RT. It was literally just talking about RT programming. And no, it wasn't talking about how I praised Putin or, you know, whitewashed the reality of what's going on in Russia. No, none of that. In fact, I never did that on my show. In fact, I was one of the anchors who actually spoke out against Putin and kept my premiere show you, for you over the, a year. Uh, when, he, when Russia invaded the Crimea, the Crimean you criticized that on open air. That's the point you're trying Absolutely. to make. Absolutely. I criticized it on, on, um, on air, and I was able to keep my primetime show for an entire year after that. I continued to criticize Putin. I talked about the downing of MA. 17, etc., and hosted rigorous debates about the Ukraine situation. But back to the intelligence report, I mean, what's amazing about it, Zen, back to your point, is that this is the real threat, right? This is the real threat, is talking about real issues. Because when you look at what that intelligence re report entails, it's literally talking about how my show covered fracking, covered income inequality, Occupy Wall Street, and how it was some sort of Russian warfare operation that we hosted a third-party debate. That's what C-SPAN does every year. So you have to understand that this basis, right, this basis that everything's Russian propaganda, if you um, talk about realities in our country, if you talk about the fact that half of Americans are living in poverty, they don't have more than $1,000 in their bank account, that's Russian propaganda. You can't criticize U.S. foreign policy, the murderous imperialism that we're carrying out around the world, And unless you're a Russian propagandist, and that logic has unfortunately bled over to now, here we are in a year and a half later, where literally activists who are protesting oil pipelines are useful idiots for the Kremlin. I mean, Jill Stein talking about U.S. imperialism is, is repeating Russian talking points. It's a really disturbing atmosphere that we're living in. I mean, if you think about it, I don't know the exact numbers because I think the official account isn't there and there's so many secret operations going on, secret bases, but I think it's something like over 150 countries, over 1,200 installations. It's not like we don't, as journalists, look at America as America. If it, if it was Great Britain today in that position, or if it was India today in that position with that military scope, uh, we'd be probably criticizing them. And what I don't seem to understand is When there's uh, a military footprint on this planet and the wars in Libya and Iraq, why do we still cannot call the empire to what it is? <laughs> yeah, I, I, people think I'm talking about Star Wars when I speak about the U.S. empire. <laughs> It, it's amazing to me. We have so many bases that even Pentagon officials won't even tell you the number of bases because there's so many lily pad bases off of that official 900 number that they don't even know. Um, we're talking about 56 military interventions that have subjugated and usurped the democratic processes of in Latin America alone. Um, we're talking about, you know, catastrophic wars that have killed millions, tens of millions of people, the use of chemical warfare, violation of international treaties, exemptions from international treaties. The list goes on and on. But the reason that you don't hear about this is because we're the best country in the world, right? We can do whatever we want. We're not the empire because we're the moral arbitrator of what's right and good and holy. Um, we have the freest media in the world. We have the freest democracy in the world. So of course, when the media works hand in glove with the establishment to sell this notion, right? It's a weapon. The media is a weapon of the empire. Um, it's not just to protect the corporate structure, it's to protect the empire and to sell these wars and narratives. And, and you see it time and again, Zen, where We just have to keep marginalizing ourselves and fighting on the margins to fight for the truth because we're just lambasted with attacks day after day from the corporate media structure. 
it's incredible. So tell me about your experience in RT. I don't want to get too deep into it because this is not an evening for RT. But how would you compare it to your colleagues in that are in Western corporate media? Did somebody call you or let's mm -hmm. say put in the mastermind from his basement in the big castle that he lives in? That's the perception that you get if you're following the news. Did he call you up and say, hey, Abby, you're supposed to report that and not report that? Or how was your experience working there? Well, it's incredible. When you look at the corporate media, you can tell who's our friend and who's our foe, right? They tell you who's the enemy and who's our friend. So Russia, Iran, Iran, Venezuela, North Korea, those are the enemies. So if there's any state-funded entities from those countries, they're also enemy networks. It doesn't matter if Al Jazeera is somehow legitimate, even though it's run by a Qatari, you know, theocratic dictatorship with virtual slave markets. So that part was always kind of hypocritical to me. Why is that okay? Why is it okay to have state-funded media enterprises funded by empires, right? BBC, France 24, um, Radio Free Europe. Sorry so, if I break you off. Yeah. Uh, the German... Uh, media over here is funded by 7.6 billion euros, I think, somewhere around that mm -hmm. line. And uh, there's no criticism if you appear in the... It's actually okay. It's if lauded. You're it's and lauded. Uh, the other point is that a large part of its finance, it's not through the conventional taxes over here, but through a uh, um, system that you call GZ, which basically uh, sends you a letter every three months telling you if you don't pay, <laughs> you're going to get some consequences. And let me just add to that. I saw a report recently where farmers that opened a small stall um, for the cows had to pay get set because it's, it's, the moment you get space, the moment you get space, they assume you're consuming media. So I was thinking, okay, you know, good way to educate a cow. But anyways, <laughs> um, uh, getting back to your point, sorry to break you off. It's like state media, corporate media, right? Right. So th th there, there we get to the next point. Telesor, uh, you're now there. What is Telesor and what is Empire Files? So I wanted to say really quickly about RT is that I had more freedom there and I was able to pave more editorial freedom than virtually anyone at corporate media. So there's limitations and there's framing and there's parameters of debate that you're allowed to say, right? At RT, I was able to pave so much editorial freedom that I was actually challenging my funder over and over again. And what the whole experience showed me was not only do we have an enormous amount of freedom there where we can really talk about anything, but that shows you what corporate media anchors and pundits and journalists don't do. They don't put their jobs on the line. They don't put themselves on the line to fight for that editorial freedom and to say, no, I'm not going to cover this story today, or I am going to do this, and I'm going to put my job on the line to do so. RT is simply an alternative. That's why it's such a threat to this corporate media narrative, um, because it provides that space to challenge right, um, the corporatocracy, challenge capitalism, challenge empire. That's why I worked there. Telesur is different. Um, because, you know, in a world where we're fostering this Cold War mentality against Russia, I think it's really important to have RT. I think it's important to hear what Russia has to say and the perspectives that Russia brings. Um, but Telesor came out of a contagion of this pink tide, this progressivism that erupted in Latin America. We're talking about a region of the world that was subjugated and ravaged by colonialism for decades, if not centuries. Cuba was always an anomaly, but with the election of Hugo Chavez in 1999, I think sparked this, this movement. And so Telesor came out of a joint venture with Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro to counter that corporate media narrative that was set as a weapon to destroy these countries, to destroy their democratically elected leaderships. And um, it's a joint venture between six countries right now, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Uruguay, Cuba, Ecuador, and Venezuela. And I'm honored because I feel like it really fits within my value system because they really tell that kind of Marxist perspective and the working class perspective and telling the voices of the marginalized and oppressed who have been completely um, obfuscated from our history books and the entire narratives of, of what we know about realities then. The Empire Files, is a show where it's a long-form documentary show and investigative series that sees every issue through the lens of US empire because you cannot look at the world either internationally or domestically in the US without looking through that lens. The world needs to be looked at in terms of colonized and colonizers. Um, you know, in terms of Israel, it's we love to use Israel as that military garrison in the Middle East because it's surrounded by kind of these post-colonial, semi-independent states that haven't cowtailed to U.S. economic hegemony yet. So that's why we like Israel in that center. But the Empire Files retells these stories, retells these narratives, um, uplifts the voices of those marginalized and oppressed people who haven't had their chance to tell their stories um, and reclaiming the, vi the, the narratives that have been written by the victors. Um, and we've had the chance to go to these countries and be on the ground and see firsthand how just completely 
patently absurd the corporate media narratives are everywhere from Colombia to Venezuela. So talk about uh, Ecuador, Venezuela, and Colombia. I mean, it's really interesting because the indigenous people uh, in these countries do not get a voice. First of all, there's this language barrier, obviously, and the second of all, who wants to go in the jungles of these places and spend uh, millions of euros or dollars to talk to these people and their concerns? What are the concerns of the indigenous people and what sort of challenges are they facing both domestically and internationally? Well, it's, it differs country to country, but I mean, Ecuador is a really interesting example because I went to the rainforest, this pristine rainforest that has just been completely savaged by Chevron. And so I saw kind Chevron of Chevron, the, the massive oil company that okay. um, you know, also sponsors a lot of uh, corporate media. So you know, corporate media is basically subsidized by defense contractors and oil companies. Um, but when I was in the rainforest uh, you know, and talking to victims who were indigenous there and, and who have died since from contamination, and it was an insight in how Ecuador was before President Correa took it and, and, and challenged the empire and started giving more rights to indigenous people. And the indigenous movement had backed him in his presidency. And he gave rights to nature, which was a really in the monument right? in the constitution, correct. And so you kind of saw, you know, pre-colonial and post-colonial mentality there where they had just opened their country up to be ravaged by, by imperialism. And then they were trying to fight back against that. Um, in terms of Venezuela, the indigenous population there is completely obscured from our media. We don't ever hear from um, the tens of millions of people who actually are diehard Chavismo. You know, that's a very serious political force in the country. And we just hear constantly that, you know, there's a totalitarian dictatorship where Maduro's forces are mowing down protesters. The reality is completely different. It's very complex. Um, people can watch my reports to learn more, but the indigenous movement, a lot of Afro-Venezuelans who you don't see their voices ever being given gravitas for. So it's, it's, um, it was incredible to go and, and give, you know, a voice to those voiceless people and hear their perspectives because they're really virtually absent. In Colombia, it was interesting because as much as we hear about Venezuela, we hear nothing about Colombia. And this is a country who we, you know, we poured $10 billion in Plan Colombia over the last 15 years. The, President Kennedy created paramilitary death squads there, and we're talking about a hidden war, even though FARC has been demilitarized and laid down their arms, there's still just as many social leaders, activists, indigenous leaders, um, trade unionists being executed, targeted for execution from these paramilitary death squads who have very close ties with Uribe, um, Uribe's party and the Santos government. And it's just shocking. It's shocking that this isn't told. You know, it's shocking that we don't know that Colombia is the most dangerous country in the world for trade unionists. I talked to a teacher who has to live in exile because he's so scared to do his work. So it's a, a very fascist um, and very reflective of the US empire. And like about Venezuela, okay, there might be some human rights uh, abuses and violations, probably did occur, I'm not sure about that. But what I feel is left out of the entire coverage, some in, in, in I will almost talk German, some Beispiel, <laughs> for example, um, is that the role of finance, I mean, people, financiers on Wall Street or Frankfurt or London just decide collectively, we are not gonna invest in this thing anymore, we're gonna do an investment strike. And so that has a huge effect on the currency and then you see all these supermarket reports coming in. But this is what I find particularly interesting that the role of finance is left out, the role of capital, if you want to put it that mm -hmm. way. So you actually went into the supermarkets. What did you see? And you also analyzed the media. I mean, you put all the newspapers on the table. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we hear the same reports, right? You can, you can virtually make up anything about Venezuela, and you can really make up anything about North Korea, and really people just regurgitate it uh, based on no verification whatsoever. So I hear constantly, you know, people are starving and, and eating rats in the streets. Look, there is a serious economic crisis. The thing is, it's very complicated. There's economic warfare going on with private versus public ownership. Like you said, the detrimental, devastating sanctions that the US forces has put on Venezuela has actually caused a lot of this economic crisis. So this is what the West likes to do. It puts devastating sanctions on countries like North Korea and Venezuela, and then it uses the effects of those sanctions to then slap human rights violations and further penalize these countries. I did go in the supermarkets. The supermarkets, when you see these, these video, uh, videos and pictures of just empty shelves completely in like supermarkets like you're in The Walking Dead, it's absurd, it's patently absurd. There's a shortage of specific items 
And th that's for a very specific reason. I mean, these items are, you know, it's like, again, it's an economic war. Um, I won't get into the nuances of it, but it's just not true when you see just like th this, this footage that you see over and over again. It's specific items, and that's what people get from the government. They get those items that have shortages every month in a bag called CLAP. Um, so I just don't understand this like very trivialized, childish narrative that just totally removes the other part of the story. As far as the media ownership, I mean, we hear the same thing with every country that the U.S. wants to overthrow and commit regime change in. It's totalitarian, there's no democracy, they don't have a free media, people are starving. And they're a national security threat. Right? <laughs> and they're a threat. Venezuela's going to come and feed us. Um, so yeah, it, it, a lot of that, you know, it's almost the opposite in a lot of these cases. Um, but yeah, I mean, the media, a lot of it is privately owned. And when I was there, I saw newspapers that were saying Trump needs to take care of Maduro on the front page. I mean, way more liberated than, uh, you know, way more hostile, let's say, toward the government than our media is. So let's move on to a different directions because talking about Telesor, which is um, a sort of Latin America wide initiative, I would put it that way, or RT, Russia, but I'm really particularly interested in citizen journalism, and mm -hmm. you started Media Roots, a citizen journalist-based uh, outlet, which you can see online, you can hear the podcast. So talk to me about the basic ingredients of citizen journalism and the importance of it as well. I wanted to say one more thing about Telesor really quickly is that I have so much editorial freedom there. I, you know, I interviewed President Correa multiple times. I had no questions vetted. Can you imagine if someone came and interviewed Trump and like didn't have their questions? I mean, that happened with Hillary Clinton and Bill, uh, Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. I think. The Clintons had to throw out somebody from the White House wow. because that, that journalist is critical. Do look that up on YouTube or uh, tap it on Google, mm -hmm. you'll find that. Anyways, getting yeah, back to that. Yeah, so just complete editorial freedom. I have no boss. I literally sell a show to the network and they air it. Um, so it's very insulting to say that you know I'm lying on behalf of, of these countries. Uh, it's absurd. Media Roots it is, is started as a citizen journalism project and uh, I was self-taught, just kind of like how I met you years ago in Berlin and look where the organization has come, Zen. I mean, it's just a little bit of commitment and dedication and never really expecting um, a reward. You know, you're not doing this to get on the front cover of magazines. You're not doing this to get recognition. You're doing it because you know it's right. And you know that you're probably always going to be on the margins fighting for what's right. But Media Roots, uh, it started off as just an aggregate of censored stories and covering different progressive movements in my backyard, covering Occupy Wall Street, covering different protests, uh, DEA raids, stuff like that, police brutality, the Oscar Grant rallies. And then RT found me through there. But I think the tools uh, of what it takes to be a citizen journalist scares the hell out of the establishment. And that's why you see anyone who's kind of taking measures into their own hands and creating their own media and trying to decolonize their mind and be media, media creators is, is a threat, right? They're all Russian stooges and Kremlin operatives. Um, but that's what's so beautiful about the era uh, of digital technology that we're living in is that everyone has the tools and capacities to teach themselves, teach others, work with peers to formulate groups that, that you know you can learn from each other. I was lucky enough to have a community center where I was able to learn Final Cut and editing and, and how to use a camera. And, um, but really, it's, it's, it's a self-taught thing. I think journalism school hammers into your head of, of how to be an objective journalist and, and makes you think that you have to be tens of thousands of dollars chained to student debt, um, when that's, n in fact, not at all. It's not this Ivy League prestigious out-of-touch thing. Anyone can do it. People are doing it. Um, but again, you have to be media literate. You have to be a critical thinker and you have to understand how to ingest the media landscape and understand the biases because it's just one component of the whole package. I want to say, like when I interviewed Edward Stone last year, and I was mm -hmm. one of the very few people to do that from Germany, I have no background in all of this journalism school. I went online and saw all the center of investigative reporting uh, techniques, methods, and stuff like that. And it's really funny when people come up to me and say, Zen, where did you study journalism and stuff? I'm like, <laughs> in my heart, you know? I, I just opened up at some point and said, I have to change things. One of the inspiring moments was Noam Chomsky's book, Manufacturing Consent, which kind of shows, structurally speaking, how the corporate media in the United States, and that research goes 20 years. It's actually a scientific paper, not even a book, of how the corporate media controls the function of information. And when it comes from the beginning to the end, it's something completely different, like right. in terms of reality. But getting back to this objective media. You have this advocacy media sort of thing, like we should send out a message, we should be constructive and not just be critical. And I'm a big fan of critical media because that's a scientific way. You have to 
we have scientific rigor. You have to question. But as I think it's also scientific to be constructive. I mean, think about our technology in that term. W we got the cure for cancer. Would everybody be saying, no, Zen, that's, uh, that's not objective. That's, uh, that's unscientific. No, because it's a solution. So can journalism also be an advocate, a constructive uh, arbitrator of information? Absolutely. I, that's why I am a proud advocacy journalist. I think objectivity is horseshit, and I think that journalists who pretend like they're objective are lying to themselves because everyone has an overt bias. You know, you think that oh, opinions just belong on those op-ed pages, and that everything else is just straight up just subjective journalism. No, everyone couches their opinions and, and pulls from this glob of neoliberalism and the, and the think tanks and the experts and the defense contractors and the anonymous government officials and they cite those people to couch their own biases and opinions in. I would w much rather know where someone's coming from, where their bias is, wearing their heart on their sleeve, and then I can determine for myself if it's accurate information. I think that, again, you're hammered into thinking that you need both sides of this story, right? I didn't even know what Palestine was until I was 18. So I think that that tells you a lot about the only side of the story that we're told, right, about that issue, which is very upsetting that in Germany, you know, you have a Haaretz journalist banned from the public square from even discussing um, or being critical of, of Zionism and Israeli war crimes. But look, I don't need to know why Monsanto poisoned um, Anniston, Alabama for decades with PCBs. I don't need to see their press release and compare it to the victims that have died. Um, I don't need to know why the Pentagon drone bombed another wedding in Yemen. Um, I don't need to know from these people and compare it to the victims who are suffering these atrocities with I my mean, tax dollars. I think about it, that's like comparing Martin Luther King Hey, Martin, <laughs> can you tell me what your opinion is about racism and then going to Ku Klux Klan yeah, 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 no. and asking the white supremacists, uh, let's, let's uh, kind of weigh in the issue. That's the same thing that you're trying and to you say, see right? It, yeah, and you see it all across the corporate media. It's just constant, just regurgitation of, of government officials. You even have them, you know, every time there's a, a dapper Nazi, you see a whole think piece about him. Uh, it's disgusting. Um, but I'm a proud advocacy journalist, A, because we don't have time, Zen. We're running out. Capitalism is eating itself. And um, you just mentioned diseases. I mean, Goldman Sachs, we've come to such a stage of late capitalism where now Goldman Sachs is just openly saying it's against their profit model to cure patients of diseases. So we don't have time left, and I'm advocating for the truth. I'm advocating for marginalized and oppressed people to reclaim their power and reclaim the truth. So let's sum it up. And the part I'm trying to sum up is the solution oriented. My brain mm -hmm. is working really fast right now, so <laughs> let me sum it up. How would you advise people to A, become citizen journalist, not advice? What, what, what sort of, like if somebody's sitting here in the crowd or watching on YouTube and that person wants to actually change the world tomorrow, yeah? What is the first challenge or the challenges that they should take into account? And what is the underlying thing that they should always keep in mind despite the hardships that they face? I think the context, the context that's missing from all of these trivialities and the stories that you mentioned in your intro, I mean, the daily inundation of these superficialities, we need to understand the context behind them, how we got here. History is instructive. We need to learn from history so we can prevent future wars. We can prevent going down this horrible, disastrous path time and time again, generation after generation. So I think A, reclaiming and relearning history, understanding how we got here. Um, be teaching yourself the tools to be media literate and critical thinker. Huge, huge base of support that you have here, Zen, and it's really inspiring for me. And I think this is where it all starts. You start a hub, and the progressive thinkers come to that hub, and they just keep building, and that's how social movements start. That's how progressive movement starts, and that's how we fight and end empire and end wars. We have to challenge that propaganda. We have to unmask the brutality of what's going on. And from there, I think we can find a much better system than what we have now. Inspiring words, Abby. <laughs> Eric Martin, visual artist, journalist and filmmaker, thank you so much for coming today. Thanks so much, Sam. I'll see you later. I'll see you later. Round, yeah? Thanks.
I would like to introduce my next guest, Jill Stein. Jill Stein was the U.S. Green Party's candidate in 2012 and 2016. She is an organizer, physician, and an environmental health advocate. During the 2016 election, she was the only candidate to call for an emergency jobs program to jointly solve the climate and economic crises and for demilitarization through a foreign policy based on international law, diplomacy, and human rights. She was the only candidate to be arrested for supporting the Dakota Sioux Nation in resisting the DAPL pipeline project. Ladies and gentlemen, Jill Stein. It's so wonderful to have you here in Munich. I thought the CIA is going to kidnap you when you were coming this way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my first question pertains to the Green Party. And I was at a bar a couple of weeks ago. And I'm not an alcoholic, just to put that, because I'm talking a lot about beer and stuff. But I was at a bar, and then I told somebody about this event. And they're like, what? There's a Green Party in the United States? I just thought there's Democratic, Republicans, i.e. the Clintons or the Bushes, uh, with the exception of Obama. So, for our young viewers, for the people that are uh, curious, can you introduce the Green Party for us? So the Green Party is the one national scale party uh, in the US that is not funded by predatory banks or fossil fuel giants or war profiteers. It is the one party that actually has the ability to respond to the desperate, urgent, and growing needs of everyday Americans. And in a nutshell, that's why they don't want you to hear about it, with 45% of Americans declining to vote because neither the Democratic nor Republican parties speak to them and their needs. You know, the, um, the political establishment does not want people to know about the competitors. I was tricked into running for office many years ago. I had been apolitical for my first 50 years of life, didn't trust the political system or parties because I only knew about the major two. And then Ralph Nader ran, and that was a big awakening for a lot of people. Ralph Nader being? So Ralph Nader uh, is a consumer advocate. He's the guy who invented safety belts, uh, who established um, uh, agencies to, for, the, for the environment, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and so on. He wrote a book called so Un Unsaving, uh, Unsafe? Unsafe at Any Speeds. Speed. And the funny part about the story, sorry that I break you <laughs> off, is that when he was writing this book, all of the big car companies, and I want to quote Henry Ford here, he said, if we get a seat belt in the car, the entire auto industry is going to collapse. I mean, think about that. Yes. That's the thinking. So he came up with this great book that brought congressional hearings and created the first national agency that takes into account uh, safety for driving. Sorry, so you can continue. Also, worker safety. He basically established the first national bureau to uh, protect workers' safety on the job. Just really an amazing uh, thinker and activist who then ran for office and actually became vilified because he dared to challenge the system. He was running as a Green Party member, and that was the first political campaign that I actually, you know, got interested in, you know, in, in being involved with because it was different from the Democrats and Republicans who basically want to sell you a bill of goods in order to maintain their stranglehold, which is the stranglehold of big corporate America, the war profiteers and banks and fossil fuel giants, that's who they're serving. So the Green Party is sort of the opposite of that. And um, I was tricked into running for office back in 2002 and discovered that there's really a very vigorous and exciting public conversation that the public is really uh, desperate to have. And since then, I've continued building uh, the Green Party as a vehicle for challenging power. It's very important that we have social movements, and at the end of the day, it really is our social movements that are the engine of change. But we have to challenge power at the same time, and our social movements have to work together. And to me, that's what the Green Party 
uh, makes possible is for us to challenge power on many fronts. Otherwise, we are divided and conquered. But if we are working together across issues, across geography, across borders, across time, as a political movement, that's when things really begin to change. So I was thinking about a quote, and I don't know who it f was from, but that person said, anonymous, that if people who didn't vote had a vote, then all parliaments would be empty, you know, most of them. Think about it, 45% of people did yeah. vote in the United States. And this is where I get to my next point. There's a Princeton study that came out uh, a couple of years ago talking about the United States being an oligarchy. Then there's this uh, political scientist, Thomas Ferguson, from the Institute for New Economic Thinking, who in congressional elections pointed out that there's a strong correlation between money and votes. You've been mm -hmm. in the system, you are a candidate, uh, you were a candidate in 2016 and 2012. Can you tell us about your experience of how you encountered the system? When I first ran for office, it was out of absolute desperation. As someone who was working uh, in the movement to create health care as a human right, to enact campaign finance reform and get the big money out of politics so we can get the people back in, uh, working for the environment as a critical issue for our economy and our health and our survival. I was seeing each movement get beaten back. And, and when I got asked to run for office, um, my thought was, might as well try that. Nothing else is working. Might as well try politics. And what I discovered was to the extent that we were able to be heard, there's enormous resonance out there. People are ready to throw the bums out, which is why the corporate media works overtime to silence us, to disappear the uh, principled opposition, because that's exactly what people are looking for. Bernie Sanders' campaign was able to reach a lot of people because they were working within the system, but at the same time, that system turned around and sabotaged them and really used that campaign to uh, suppress a real revolt. So it's clear that um, the power is there. It's just a question of our organizing to make it happen, and that's why I'm so grateful to activism and to uh, Abby and to independent journalism because that is how we get the word out and we empower ourselves to actually make that change that people are hungry for. You talked about the media and I did some research last night and I found out that the Tyndall report and that analyzes major network news coverage. And they did an analysis in 2015 of 1,000 minutes of broadcast time that was aired during that time. And they came up with the following numbers. Trump received 327 minutes, Clinton 121 minutes, Sanders 20 minutes. You didn't make the list, unfortunately, but it's not an award ceremony. Um, it speaks more for independent media. But I mean, what would be very interesting is, how did you react in the moment? Did you campaign, try to reach out to journalists? Did you guys try to, uh, we tried really hard, and our uh, press uh, director, Chris, we worked day and night to try to get the press to come here today, you know? I know if Hillary Clinton was here, I know if Bernie Sanders even was here, they would be here uh, en masse. Some of journalists have come, so I give that credit due where it is due. But getting back to your campaign, did you guys do anything, did you guys think about strategies of how to reach the press, and how was their response? Uh, yes, and um, I first ran for office in 2002, and the strategy of the press, which is essentially to uh, create a complete media blackout on political alternatives. At a time in the last election when 75% of Americans were screaming for open debates because Clinton and Trump were the most untrusted, disliked candidates in modern history ever on record. So people were screaming for something else. So you know the press has to work very hard in order to suppress that revolt. That revolt has already begun. That revolt is happening and it's growing every day. And over the many years that I've been running for office and seeking to build a politics of integrity to challenge that hegemony, um, 
I must say, you know, the movement is growing. The system is self-destructing. The empire is doubling down because it has lost its grip. We have an empire that is teetering at the brink. So it's only a question of when, not whether, that empire will essentially fall apart. And in my view, the more we do to organize, the more we do to encourage groups like yourself, like activism, the faster we will break through and the greater the odds are that we will break through in time because we're working against a ticking clock. Whether you're looking at the climate, at nuclear weapons, at endless war, at austerity, at globalization and, uh, and the financialization and hollowing out of our economies, racial disparities, the war on immigrants, you name it. Um, uh, this is the final act in many, on, on many fronts. This is the final act. So there's no question that the, uh, the predatory system that we know is in its final stages. So it's really important for us to do everything we can to prepare for the next stage, knowing that we have on our side the climate, the economy, basically uh, um, advocates or shall we say a uh, witness to the um, unsustainability and immorality of this system. This system is a, is a sinking ship. It's up to us to build that lifeboat as fast as we can. In the campaign, we did everything we could. From you know, your routine press releases, press conference, et cetera, the time that we really got attention, it was generally when I got arrested or <laughs> had threat of being arrested. And over the two campaigns, I was arrested four times for very important causes on behalf of people who were being thrown out of their homes, uh, homeowners on behalf of uh, Standing Rock, uh, on behalf of the Keystone Pipeline blockade. Um, you know, these were very important issues and getting arrested for them was both an act of principle and that it was also a, uh, a public relations strategy uh, was uh, a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we are all landing on some sort of list, and Chomsky landed on Nixon's enemies list. Uh, Abby was on a list that I mentioned today. <laughs> You're landing on some list, and I'm wondering when I'm going to land in some list, cause, but it's really easy because I'm brown. So I think uh, it wouldn't be really hard for the Americans to conjure up some terrorist sort of uh, label. But getting to the next point, um, in the fall, and here we get to your list. In the fall of 2017, uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, accused or alleged your campaign for Russian collusion. You submitted your documents that they asked for this April. So give us, number one, what is a Senate Intelligence Committee for our German viewers? Secondly, give us some background and also the reason why they're after you now. So, you know, the Senate, like any um, congressional body, uh, has v various committees, foreign policy, finance, labor, etc. And one committee is uh, dedicated to intelligence. So sort of matters of strategy that aren't obvious, that you have to sort of look into, that you need your FBI and your NSA in order to find out about. And as I think you mentioned in your discussion with Abby, uh, the intelligence committee uh, or community had put out this report that uh, both Abby and I had the honor uh, to be in. And, uh, you know, we were both honored with these absurdities that made us out to be very important people. And, and, you know, I appreciate the compliment, but it was completely unsubstantiated. It, it named, for example, the fact that my trip to Russia for a conference, a 10-year anniversary conference held by RT, a substantive and very interesting conference on media and foreign relations. Uh, it said that my trip was paid for by the Kremlin that, and that essentially I was a Kremlin tool speaking uh, Kremlin talking points and implying that I was in collusion and that the Green Party uh, also was, which is absurd. And I had very concrete proof that this was wrong because I have my uh, my receipts that show that I paid for everything about that trip. 
which told you right off the bat that their intelligence was not correct. They said that I was paid for, but in fact, I had to prove that it was not paid for by Russia. This was paid for by my campaign. So anyhow, that was used essentially then as part of an ongoing smear to, um, to really uh, vilify, to criminalize me as a Russian tool and as you and Abby were discussing, to make the point that all criticism uh, about militarism or, or the uh, climate crisis, um, uh, protests for Black Lives Matter, these are all Russian tools and these ideas are purely Russian talking points, which tells you what's really going on here. This is a very stupid strategy to try to distract people from the real issues that are going on in our lives. And so I was essentially accused of, of being in collusion and I turned over really all of our campaign information that they requested except where it intruded on our civil liberties. Um, their request for basically internal political information which is a uh, part of the Bill of Rights that government cannot spy on political organizations. You can't do that. So it's not like I had some special material I couldn't, I couldn't turn over, but rather that we were standing up on principle. We were not going to be a party to this assault on our civil liberties, which is actually taking place across the board. Whether you look at the assault on privacy, with the recent Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, with 87 million people having their private data taken, that data up to 2,000 data points per person so that they can weaponize that data and target you with disinformation, that's what's interfering with our elections. The evidence that the Russians interfered with our elections is really uh, minute and, shall we say, not compelling. In my view, the question of interference in our elections is actually a really important question. And that's another reason why I wanted uh, to cooperate. But in fact, the evidence for Russian interference is tiny compared to the evidence for interference by big media that gave $6 billion in free airtime to Donald Trump, twice as much as to Hillary Clinton, because he was, quote, damn good for corporate <laughs> profits. And the president of CBS, I don't know if you've heard this quote, said, in fact, Donald Trump may not be good for America, but he sure is good for CBS. You know, should that be what is deciding our elections? I mean, he's already uh, dividing the country by saying that. I mean, that means America something else and his corporation, which is based in the United States, I mean, isn't that interference as exactly. well? Exactly, or interference by oligarchs like Robert Mercer, who is a, uh, um, a very right-wing billionaire investor, really a Wall Street gambler, one of the richest people uh, in America and the world, who funded, by the way, the um, program called Citizens United, which essentially opened the floodgates to unlimited billionaire money, corporate money, to buy out our elections. So that was coming from this right-wing billionaire who basically uh, intensified the stranglehold of big money on our political system. He's the same guy who was funding Cambridge Analytica who weaponized our stolen private data. So is that not interfering with our elections? It seems to me that this Cold War, let's put this seems to me away, the Cold War is back. Yeah? Yes. And you see that in Syria with five nuclear states, Russia, United Kingdom, France, the US and Israel, mm -hmm. these are nuclear states, mm -hmm. are flying around the whole airspace. Today we have around 14,175 nuclear weapons, 6,600 owned by Russia and 6,450 owned by the United States. So there's this, also this ratchet up of this military industrial complex and I'm not just talking about the United States, we'll touch on that, but in Germany there's a huge talk going on right now about Germany needs to increase its international presence in the Eastern Front and, and we need not just a bigger military bu budget but we need to place troops, we need to make no r new roads that lead up to this. So where is all of this militarization leading and what effects does it have on our social fabric? 
Yeah, so militarization is um, immoral, unsustainable, untenable, and it needs to be rolled back very quickly. And let me just summarize by saying, when, uh, when Pearl Harbor was bombed at the start of the Second World War, the United States declared a state of emergency. It took six months to militarize our economy to a wartime footing. Well, we now have a new kind of emergency. It's called a climate emergency. We need to declare a state of national and international emergency based on the climate. And we need to finally roll back that militarized economy and change it over to a green and peaceful economy. That can happen also in six months if we decided to do that. So the bottom line is... <laughs> Whether we are talking about the climate emergency or the nuclear weapons emergency, among those weapons you mentioned, there are 2,000 of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. 2,000 nuclear weapons which are on hair trigger alert between the U.S. Explain that. On hair trigger alert means that they're, they're ready for sending. You know, all they need is the, is the red button to be pushed. By Donald Trump. By Donald Trump or by a drunken... Um, Supervisor, drunken and, monkey. yes, a drunken monkey, for example. Yes, there are, there are, a, or for a false alert to be uh, sent, there are many ways that that those weapons could be triggered, and we are really uh, sitting at the edge of potential catastrophe with nuclear weapons being what they are. And again, the press doesn't let you know that in fact there is a new treaty a global treaty proposed at the United Nations by the majority of the world's nations to ban our nuclear weapons. We could all sign that treaty right now. What's happening on the Korean Peninsula should be happening all over the world, including in Syria and far beyond. So the bottom line is we could move from a nuclear, militarized, lethal economy to a green and sustainable economy and address in one fell swoop not only the dangers of war, we can uh, turn the tide on climate change, and in fact we can make wars for oil obsolete, wars for oil and fossil fuel pipelines and the rest. We can make the whole war machine obsolete by essentially greening our economies and our energy supply to start with. You know, You know, I was saying drunk monkey because I read this book on whistleblowers and they literally, uh, the, uh, the federal agencies do like this testing of how they can penetrate nuclear sites in case of, you know, terrorism exercises and their rate at which they could enter these bases and uh, literally a drunken monkey could have gone in these nuclear sites. And there was a whistleblower also in Great Britain that revealed mm -hmm. how the uh, submarine nuclear systems are completely unchecked. So we are talking about nuclear mm -hmm. catastrophe could just come by just a drunken monkey, That's you know? Right. Yeah. Anyways, yes. enough drunken monkey. Uh, getting to the military industrial complex, I want to make a bridge between military industrial complex and the climate change. Mm -hmm. um, the US military, and this I read on Guardian, is estimated to, the US military alone as an institution is estimated to release, s s in 2015, release 70 million tons of carbon dioxide. This does not include the drones or the covert operations. Mm -hmm. Oil change reported that the Iraq war itself, the first four years, released 140, 141 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions in, four, in the first four years, which was more than 139 countries. Mm -hmm. And then, Think about it this way, what the facts I'm reading. Media Matters did a study then, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox News, they analyzed their coverage, and in 2016, only 50 minutes was dedicated. Sorry, 2015. And although 2015 was one of the hottest years, the entire media network gives it 50 minutes of coverage. I don't want to just paint a bad picture. Could you talk comment on these things briefly and also talk about how we can break the silence on this. I think it's really important um, to understand what it means, why it is that media has to black out 
the reality of climate change or nuclear weapons or the war in Yemen, they have to black it out because public resistance is so strong. How many polls have we seen showing public support, for example, uh, for these recent airstrikes in Syria? There's no discussion of public opinion here because they know if they ask, they're not going to like what they hear. One poll was done, only one that I have seen, that was in the United Kingdom just before the Syria strikes. And support for those strikes was running at 22%. Opposition was twice as much, and most people were saying, what's going on here and why do you want to go to war anyhow? So there's there's enormous public opposition that can be mobilized. The fact that they have to blank us out, that they have to disappear us, should be taken as testimony to how very powerful our movement is for people, for planet, and for peace over profit. We have a very powerful movement on each of those fronts, and if we join them together, we're absolutely unstoppable. So I think the point is, you know, for us to not allow them to discourage us. That is their most powerful weapon, is to try to convince us that we are powerless and to make us hopeless. But in fact, by recognizing we have the power, we do have the power, we can use that power, and the role of media here is so critical. So I really urge people to support this incredible organization, activism, and to become involved with it, and to become involved with the grassroots movements for uh, each of these issues, because by doing that, uh, we will reach critical mass. The only question is when, and the empire will continue to stumble and provide us openings to make that happen. So it's important for us to be in touch and to work together going forward. Chris, get ready to receive a lot of emails tomorrow. We'll be working <laughs> overtime, uh, processing new applicants, but let's see how it goes after this evening. Anyways, the other aspect I wanted to talk to you about is the solutions to climate change. And in particular, and I don't want to uh, demonize the Greens. They're good on the communal level, on foreign policy and other issues. They're not that great, I would say. Um, they do believe in this Russia demonizing thing and have in, uh, in the war uh, in the former Yugoslavia supported that. But the, and also the solutions that they propose is just tax the big corporations. Let's put up some signs to ban cars coming here and stuff like that. Um, you know, Exxon and Shell recently were exposed and they did their own research da dating decades back. And now explosive uh, revelations have come out that they knew about climate change, they knew about the consequences about it. So are you proposing, or what is your take on this? Should we employ the solution based on these corporations, let them trade with each other and decide how the market will decide the outcome of the climate? Or is there another way that we can find a solution that is sustainable and will change the course of climate change? Absolutely, we need systemic, changes and that means we have to challenge the whole framework of neoliberalism, capitalism, predatory capitalism. You know, we really need system change here. Uh, changes along the margins, changing the window dressing isn't going to do it. And I want to acknowledge that, that um, the German Greens played a very important role decades ago in launching the Green Movement. And uh, Petra Kelly was uh, really played a major role in articulating uh, the green agenda. And a foremost part of that agenda was grassroots democracy, that is from the bottom up, and social and economic justice from the bottom up. And uh, unfortunately, in becoming part of the power system here in, uh, in Germany, uh, the German Green Party has gone in a somewhat different direction. And I'll say that there's a... <laughs> And let me say, I know people within the German Green Party who are not seeing eye to eye with the leadership. So I uh, encourage people not to consider this a, lo a lost cause, that our political parties should be responsive to their grassroots, and we as activists can change what that grassroots looks like. But within the Green Parties um, around the world, there's been a very strong 
uh, shift to the left that uh, the German Green Party has not been a part of. So you see, for example, the, um, uh, the left Greens in the Netherlands, which are now the number one party uh, in the urban areas. Um, the, uh, the left Greens in Iceland, which the president is now a member of that coalition. So over time, we are seeing the movements for social and economic justice and for uh, climate, radical climate action really come together because you cannot get climate justice unless you also have economic and social and racial and immigrant justice. As Martin Luther King said, a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. <laughs> and the party has to represent all of those issues of justice. And as Martin Luther King also said, you know, you cannot get to justice if we have a perpetual state of war, which is why we must dismantle the war machine. So I think green parties all over the world are moving in that direction, and I hope that the German Green Party will also. In, in terms, <laughs> yes. In terms of uh, specific solutions, in many of the green parties in the U.S., well, the U.S. Green Party and many other areas around the world are calling for uh, a Green New Deal, which is essentially an emergency program. It's an emergency jobs program to create the jobs which will simultaneously solve the climate crisis, the economic crisis, and the crisis of war. And it will green our energy system with 100% clean renewable energy, no nuclear, no fossil fuels, no uh, unnatural gas, and so on. Um, a green food system, 100% organic, and also a uh, so-called climate farming, which helps sequester carbon dioxide, so that that too is part of our agricultural system. And public transportation, which is um, run on 100% on renewable power. So that, that can be achieved within 15 years if we put our mind to it. If we could militarize our economy in six months, we can demilitarize and green our economy and put an end to these endless, devastating, catastrophic wars for oil within the next 15 years. If you could look in the future, or if you, would, if you had a crystal ball in front of you, what do you see? Uh, what I clearly see are coming decades of struggle. We are in that struggle right now. I mean, certainly in the US, where half of the population is in or near poverty, where people are chronically sick. I mean, not only do we not have health care, but we have a system of, of pollution and stress and unemployment that makes chronic disease really prevalent. Like almost one out of it, two Americans have some form of chronic disease and they don't have health care to go with it. You know, we have a generation locked in debt. Um, I think America is pointing to where we're going on the neoliberal agenda that has unfortunately been adopted by much of the Western world. So what's happening in America, the kind of devastation that has hit us, you know, is, is following as we see the social safety net being rolled back in Germany and elsewhere uh, in the European Union. So uh, struggle has come home. There's devastation where we are uh, conducting our wars. And we have mass refugee migrations that have been created by these wars. And you know, if you think that what is it now? It's about 63 million migrants on the move, either internally or externally displaced. If you think it's bad now, wait 15 years with the climate, <clears throat> let alone what may happen with the wars. So, you know, struggle is coming to us. It's very important that we meet it head on. There is nowhere else to go. But the minute you begin to struggle with it, it's an extremely empowering and uplifting struggle. Uh, I myself, you know, became political out of desperation, seeing as a physician really what was happening to our health in America, the richest nation in the world, uh, these epidemics of chronic disease. Um, you know, I became politically active once I realized that just fighting on the issues is a hopeless proposition because they will, uh, uh, they will sabotage you 
uh, at every step, whether it's about the climate or jobs or, uh, or health care. Uh, it's a bait and switch kind of system. The system itself has to be switched. The bums have to be thrown out. We need to get together because the minute we do get together across issues, uh, we are very powerful, and to me that's what a political movement is. It is a coalition across issues, across time, and across geography that reaches critical mass so we can get the change we need. In the words of Alice Walker, the famous American uh, poet and novelist, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. So the inverse of that is by recognizing that we do have power, we can then begin to use that power and to create an America, a Europe, a world, an Africa, an Asia, and so on, a world that works for all of us, that puts people, planet, and peace over profit. The minute we get together to make that happen, we're on our way. So let's make it so. <laughs> Jill Stein, thank you so much thank for you. coming today. Thank it you. It was a pleasure My to honor. have you. And thank you. I'll see you soon. Okay. Later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Glenn Greenwald will be our next guest. Glenn Greenwald is a former constitutional lawyer, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, and the author of several bestsellers, including Liberty and Justice for Some and No Place to Hide, Edward Snowden, the NSA, and the U.S. Surveillance State. He is acclaimed as one of the top 25 political commentators by The Atlantic, one of America's top 10 opinion writers by Newsweek, and one of the top global thinkers for 2013 by Foreign Policy. He was a columnist for The Guardian until October 2013 and is a founding editor of The Intercept. Ladies and gentlemen, Glenn Greenwald. Hi Glenn, how's it going in Brazil? Um, it's going great. I'm, I'm a little bit jealous that I'm not there with you in Munich. It's one of my favorite cities in the world, but um, otherwise I'm, I'm doing well. Perfect. I, I tracked you down twice when you were here and I was able to manage two interviews, but this is the third one. So let's just begin with Donald J. Trump. Trump, sorry. Uh, Trump's perception. Th th there's this perception about Trump that he's a madman. He's unorthodox, he's breaking from conventional uh, American politics, and he's not following in many issues the same line as, as his predecessors. So what is your take? Is Donald Trump breaking from orthodoxy? Is he a continuation or is he a mixed bag? I think it's important to separate the stylistic or rhetorical analysis with regard to that question from the substantive and policy analysis. So obviously as a matter of personality, as a matter of rhetoric, and as a matter of style, Trump is something unlike we've seen before in terms of somebody occupying the Oval Office and being the representative of this vast power that the United States continues to wield in the world, the way he speaks, the things he says, his refusal to abide by protocols and conventions. But if you actually look at the policies that he has overseen and implemented, and even the way in which he defends those policies, I think that it's far more a continuation and a byproduct of American political culture than something unrecognizable or aberrational. There's a lot of people who want to pretend that what he's doing is some kind of radical break from the American tradition because they're embarrassed, because because his rhetorical newness does sort of take the mask off of the face of what the reality of the United States and the world is. And so they want to pretend that this is something all new. And I remember when Trump had General Sisi of Egypt to the White House, the American media decided to pretend that this was something brand new that we had never seen before, an American president embracing a tyrant. Um, 
And of course, American presidents have embraced tyrants. It's been central to American foreign policy for decades. And I think you see that over and over. There's a lot of pretense that what Trump is is new, but the reality is he's far more a continuation than a deviation from American political history. Let's dig deeper into that for a second, uh, Glenn. So what about the surveillance state? In 2013, you exposed the entire NSA cache that Edward Snowden had leaked. And some of the things were like millions of Germans are being, uh, their data is being collected without their consent. Uh, WikiLeaks also from this cache revealed that our chancellor's handy is being uh, spied on by our so-called allies. And this investigation was dropped last year. So how has the state of mass surveillance been under Donald Trump? And what do you think, how Germany has reacted to, it, to this generally up to this point? So I think that that's a, a, you know, a great example of, of what it is that I was just saying is this note in reporting that we were able to do um, showing that there was this massive scheme conducted and, and constructed largely in the dark to spy on the entire internet including hundreds of millions of Germans and other people around the world, was not something that was done by Donald Trump, but was done by his predecessor, uh, George Bush, and then especially Barack Obama. And the war crimes that WikiLeaks exposed in Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq um, and other places as a result of the brave leaks of Chelsea Manning were not crimes committed under Donald Trump. They were crimes committed <clears throat> under George Bush and Barack Obama. And so I think that when you look at the actual apparatus of national security that the United States continues to be shaped and governed by, it has changed very little under Donald Trump. Um, there was some early indications from him rhetorically that he intended to actually restrain a lot of this militarism, restrain a lot of the imperial behavior that people on the left and even increasingly some on the right have been so critical of. And I think that although there was some rhetorical indications from Trump early on that he intended to radically restrain or alter uh, the role that the US plays in the world, if you look at what the US is doing in the world militarily in terms of the CIA, in terms of the NSA, um, it's very much unchanged. So since we're at uh, state surveillance, let's move on to corporate surveillance. Facebook, as you know, uh, handed out 87 million uh, users' data to Cambridge Analytica, which then uh, gave it out for political purposes to Donald Trump's campaign. So, I mean, it's not really a deviation if you look at the principle at play, giving data without your consent, because your revelations revealed in 2013, you presented slides which showed that how corporations are willingly giving data to the NSA. Can you comment on this scandal and also generally on the state of affairs of privacy of ind individuals? Well, I guess I'm, I'm always a little bit surprised whenever there's surprise about the fact that large Silicon Valley companies don't actually care about our privacy. This is, I think, in general, inherent to how corporations think to the extent we can talk about corporations, how they reason. They're interested in profit motives and not social values. In fact, there are laws in the United States and, and also in various countries in Europe that require corporate managers to think first and foremost about corporate profit and how to maximize it and not think about how to maximize social value. So it would be very surprising if Silicon Valley companies, the largest and most powerful corporations human history has ever known, had decided at some point that they were going to sacrifice corporate profit in order to protect social values. And as you suggested, uh, a lot of the reporting that we were able to do showed that these Silicon Valley companies, particularly the biggest ones, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Apple, Microsoft, uh, were actively and aggressively collaborating with the US government and it's for surveillance allies around the world in the UK, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, when they were able to do that without anybody knowing about it. I think what has actually changed as a result of the Snowden reporting is that these companies now do take greater steps in order to protect people's privacy, not because Eric Schmidt at Google or Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook suddenly woke up and decided, actually, you know what, we kind of are are, are wrong and we should value privacy more. Um, it's because people around the world began 
to be worried about what it would mean if they were using Facebook and they were using Google and Facebook executives and Google executives were very worried that social media companies in Germany and Brazil and Korea would be able to tell the next generation of internet users don't use Facebook and Google because they're gonna give your data to the government, the US government use ours instead because we'll protect your privacy. So because of those commercial pressures, these companies actually have been implementing some meaningful privacy protections. Um, but at the same time now, this is the war that the US government, the UK government, governments around the world are on the one hand trying to pressure social media companies to give them as much data as they want. When they don't, they get publicly accused of being haters and abettors of terrorists, um, as the US and UK governments have done with Facebook and Google when they refuse to turn over data. Um, and you see now Facebook starting to do things like weaken encryption for WhatsApp, which caused the founder of WhatsApp um, just recently, this week in fact, to resign from the company and, and leave the board of Facebook. Um, but on the other hand, you still have you know, tens of millions of people around the world, I would say principally the country where this is true the most is in Germany because of the history of digital privacy, but also in lots of other countries, including where I am now in Brazil and the United States, where people are unwilling to use technology companies if they believe that those companies are going to undermine their privacy. And that's really the central war that's taking place right now is the war for public opinion not because com these companies care about public opinion in and of itself, but because they perceive it as a threat to their profitability uh, if they're perceived as being privacy violators. You recently wrote a piece uh, about Facebook's subordination uh, in terms of uh, the Israeli government as well as the government of the United States in deleting accounts or uh, no, uh, deleting accounts of people who are on the sanction list as well as suppressing activism. Can you elaborate on that, please? Sure. So yeah, I think there is this interesting debate taking place, and it's taking place on the left, um, the global left, about the extent to which we want governments and corporations, uh, Silicon Valley corporations, to control and regulate and censor the political content that is available for us to see. And I think there's always this appeal for people to want to support censorship, which is, well, I believe that if things, if we empower Facebook executives or Twitter officials or government officials to regulate speech under the guise that it's hate speech or fake news, the kinds of opinions that I dislike and that I think are threatening or that I think are misleading are going to be suppressed and therefore society will be better. And that's an appealing way to think, but I think it's an extremely dangerous and usually misguided way to think because usually the people who exercise power and who are gonna be able to control what we see and we don't see aren't people who think the way that you think if you're on the left, for example. They're not going to be looking to censor um, Israelis who are cheering for genocide or apartheid in Gaza. And they're not looking for people in the United States who are calling for Iran to be bombed as, as Twitter is offering every single day or for minorities to be attacked. They're gonna cater to the powerful. And the powerful in the case of the Middle East, for example, is not the Palestinians, but Israel. And so Facebook officials have been meeting with the Israelis. Uh, whoever the Israeli government tells Facebook is an inciter of violence and terrorism, gets their account suspended, their account deleted. That has included scholars, it's included journalists uh, in the West Bank. Um, that Facebook is essentially being subservient to the dictates of the Israeli government. Um, we've seen the same thing with the United States. If you are a group that the United States decides to call a terrorist organization, which in the past has included things like the African National Congress and Nelson Mandela, um, the, then Facebook executives and Twitter executives will censor political content. Um, but if you're somebody who wants to cheer Donald Trump or call for additional violence in the Middle East, you won't be censored. And so I think we need to be extremely careful um, if we believe in internet freedom about not being tricked into supporting censorship based on this lovely idea that the views that we think are violent and we think are dangerous are gonna be suppressed because in almost every case, the opposite is going to happen. It's the views that you like, the views that you support um, that are gonna end up being suppressed. In the case of Facebook, 
censoring Palestinians from the internet at the behest of the Israeli government is a perfect illustration of that danger. Since we're at the Middle East, let's talk about Syria. There's so many conflicting reports, chemical attacks by Jaish al-Islam, a radical uh, extremist Islamic group. Um, I don't call it Islam, but let's just put it that way since the media does right now. And also then there's Assad attacking, and then what do you think should be the conclusion here on a policy framework? Should the Western government intervene forcefully in these cases? So I think it's very difficult to know exactly what's going on in Syria, in part because it's always difficult to know exactly what's taking place in a very active war zone, um, especially when each side has foreign proxies that are supporting it and that are behind it, as is the case in, in the war in Syria. Um, obviously, any decent human being looks at what has happened to Syria over the past six years with horror and disgust, and it's one of the world's greatest humanitarian tragedies. At the same time, um, the fact that something is taking place that is heinous and awful doesn't mean that any solution that's proposed will actually make it better. Oftentimes, the solutions that are proposed make things worse. And so I don't pretend to have the answers for how to resolve the conflict in Syria, but what I do know is that every time Western governments proclaim that they're going to militarily intervene in other countries in the name of humanitarianism, exactly the opposite results happen. They make things worse in all instances, or virtually all instances, from a humanitarian perspective. And the And you know, I don't, I don't think that should be surprising, um, because the reason the U.S. government spends more than the next 12 nations combined on its military is not because it wants to spread freedom and democracy around the world. Humanitarianism is not actually the motive for that. And the reason NATO exists and occasionally or more than occasionally starts wars and bombs people is not because they're trying to bring freedom and democracy to people around the world who are suffering under tyranny. The reason those things exist is because that is what bestows power on Western nations to let them manipulate the world for their own interest. And that's always going to be what Western intervention is about. Humanitarianism is the pretext, it's the costume, it's the dressing in which it's wrapped up. So no matter what your views on Syria are, no matter who you think are the primary culprits, the one thing I know for certain is that US military action which, by the way, would be led by the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, whose name is Donald Trump, um, is not going to make things better for people in Syria. So let's switch to other regions in the Middle East. Let's talk about Gaza and Yemen, particularly. How would you compare the reaction that happens in Syria com in contrast to these two places? Let's start with Gaza. So it's this really, there's this really interesting paradox that I think we see in Western discourse all the time, which is that atrocities committed by allies of Western governments are typically ignored or worse justified, whereas atrocities committed by enemies of the United States and NATO are screamed about and protested and highlighted. And so if the Russians drop a bomb in Syria that kills civilians, that generates intense media coverage and denunciation. But if the Saudis bomb, as they so often do, uh, civilian facilities in Yemen on purpose that kill scores of women and children and innocent men, and particularly even more so when the Israelis just shoot unarmed protesters in the head or the back using snipers, um, there's very little coverage of that and even less denunciation. And, you know, you can actually, I guess, make the argument that if you're a citizen of a Western country, you ought to be condemning both of those equally. You ought to be condemning when the Russians kill people equally to when the United States and its allies do. But to me, actually, I think there's a much more compelling moral principle, which is that we ought to be most concerned about the evil committed not by governments thousands of miles away from us over which we exercise no influence, for which we have no responsibility and which we cannot change, but our own governments who are engaging in these atrocities in our name. 
And so as an American citizen and as an American journalist, um, it isn't that I value certain lives over other lives. I ask myself the question, what is it that I can do the most about? And what I can do the most about is my own government support for incredibly tyrannical and murderous governments like the one in Saudi Arabia and like the one in Israel. And we have utterly reversed that um, because that's what propaganda is. Propaganda is about convincing a citizenry that your side is the moral one and the other side is the immoral one. And the way you accomplish that is by ignoring the atrocities committed by your own side. Um, what Saudi Arabia is doing in Yemen, I think, is probably the worst humanitarian atrocity. Um, and what the Israelis have done to the Palestinians, people in Gaza specifically over the last five to six decades is probably the greatest moral atrocity of the last half of the 20th century and early part of the, of the 21st century. And the United States government, and for that matter, your government in Munich um, and governments throughout Western Europe are directly responsible for all of that because they support and protect and enable and empower the governments that are responsible for that, and that ought to be our main focus. I want to talk about Russia, and specifically about Russia Gate. And you've done a great deal of work uh, exposing the debacles of corporate media and their false reporting about Russian interference in the election. There was a great amount of concern in Germany as well as France about Russian interference didn't turn out to be true. The director of the Digital Society Germany in Germany said nothing happened. Uh, in France, it was the same case by the head of the cybersecurity. Uh, basically, Russia did nothing. But yet, Germany is increasing its military presence. It's actually taking a role in, in trying to increase its military budget, uh, trying to reach this two-person target of NATO, and also talking about uh, placing its presence in the Eastern uh, Bloc, which basically means, in other words, in front of Russia's rose, nose. Uh, so could you talk about uh, Russia Gate and the implications it has on democracy and, on our, and our society? So it's hard for me to express to people who don't live in the United States and who don't follow United States politic political debate on a daily basis just how utterly insane and deranged Americans have become about Russia. Um, the person to whom you just spent the last hour listening, Dr. Jill Stein, is widely regarded, not by fringe lunatics in American politics, but by the most mainstream political and media figures in both parties, to be a Russian agent. Like, they actually think she works for the Kremlin. That's how completely insane they've become. And if you ask them for evidence for that, they'll say that she once went to a dinner in Moscow that Putin attended for about six minutes, um, along with dozens of other uh, international peace activists around the world. Um, this kind of guilt by association and this kind of hysteria and conspiracy that drove um, the entire Cold War when it came to American propaganda about Moscow has reared its head, but in a much, I think, more toxic and irrational way, because there was actually a communist, a, 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 a communist movement in the latter half of the 20th century that was the opposite of what the American philosophy was, and they were two huge major countries opposing one another around the world. Russia is nothing like that. Um, Russia is the eighth largest economy in the world. It's actually just behind Italy. Um, it has very few global ambitions um, beyond its immediate neighborhood. Um, to, to try and convince people that Russia poses some sort of grave threat to the West to the point where we need to build our military budgets up is insanity, but it's, ex it's exactly what Western political discourse has become. Um, you know, if you look at the insanity of it in Germany, I think it becomes particularly vivid. I mean, there were two of the most horrific wars fought in the 20th century um, because of tensions between Germany and Russia. Um, the Cold War came close to virtually annihilating the species because of tensions between Moscow and Washington, countries that continue to have thousands of nuclear-tipped missiles pointed at one another's cities using very archaic Cold War triggers, trigger systems um, that can easily go off through misperception and miscommunication. So the idea of playing games with 
tensions between Russia and Western countries, um, especially given how NATO has virtually encircled Russia um, by moving all the way up to its eastern borders, exactly how NATO promised not to do when Gorbachev agreed to allow for the reunification of Germany. Um, very provocative behavior on the part of the West continually. Um, it makes it extraordinary to watch American political discourse become obsessed with ratcheting up tensions, it's one of the most dangerous things I've ever seen, and it's also one of the most despicable, because the real reason for it, the real reason why this is happening, is because Democrats in Washington still cannot accept responsibility for the fact that they lost to a person who basically is a game show host. They don't want to do any kind of introspection about why they've collapsed as a national party. Um, that's true of, kind of parties in, in Western Europe as well. It's always easiest to blame a foreign villain, to try and create a foreign monster that you get your population to focus on so that they forget about the problems and corruptions of your own country. And in the best of cases, it's a deceitful thing to do because it buries the real problems that we have. But when you're playing games with nuclear armed powers that have a history of starting world wars and that came close to dropping nuclear bombs on one another, it's one of the most morally reprehensible things I've seen in my 12 years of covering politics as a journalist. So what does, this, what does the assumption that Trump somehow magically from his basement of his castle interfered through Twitter bots and everything and was able to bring Donald Trump in power has Donald Trump enacted policies that have benefited Russia in any way? Right. So, okay, first of all, let's just look at the premise of this for a second, right? So we hear constantly um, the overriding media narrative that Trump is a moron, that Trump is an idiot, that Trump probably has mental health problems, that he has dementia, that he barely even knows where he is, all of which are reasonable things to think if you pay attention to how he speaks and what he says. Um, and so, at the same time, the argument gets put beside that, that Vladimir Putin, this kind of global mastermind, decided to interfere in the U.S. election and needed Donald Trump to conspire and collude with him. I mean, if the Russians were going to interfere in the 2016 election, why would they need Donald Trump um, to help them? What possible services could he provide? What kind of aid and, and assistance could he do? Was he masterminding the hacking? Was he um, plotting how to distribute the information? The whole theory kind of collapses onto itself when you think about what it is that they're typically saying. But even if you look at what Trump has done since he's been in office, right? So the argument originally was that Trump was sort of captive to the Kremlin in part out of gratitude for the fact that they helped him win, but also because the, 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 the crazier people in American politics were saying that they actually have blackmail material over him. They have a, a videotape of him engaging in sexually incriminating acts and all kinds of fantasies that they got from television and movies and novels about the Cold War where the Russians blackmail people. And that Trump was essentially a puppet, literally, of Putin, that he pulls the strings and, and Trump does what he wants. Since Trump has been in office, um, he did something that Obama refused to do in Syria, which is bomb the Russians' client state um, in Syria. He has also done something much more important to the Russians, which Obama refused to do, which is arm anti-Russian elements in Ukraine with lethal weapons, something that Putin finds generally th genuinely threatening and genuinely provocative. He has expelled Russian diplomats. He's imposed sanctions on oligarchs very close to uh, the Kremlin and to Vladimir Putin. So if you were to try and find evidence for any of this, the idea that um, Trump is captive to Putin or that the Kremlin controls the White House now, not only would you find no evidence, what you would actually find is that Trump has been more confrontational with Moscow than Barack Obama was. Um, which I say not with any admiration, but with criticism. And I think a major part of the reason why is because the climate that has been created in Washington is such that, like with Jill Stein, unless you advocate dropping bombs on Moscow, um, you're going to be smeared as a Russian agent. And, you know, I always say this, and I guess there's a part of it that's exaggerated for dramatic effect, but I actually do genuinely believe it. 
The more evidence that you provide for any conspiracy theorist that their conspiracy theory is false, the more they're gonna take that evidence and use it as proof their conspiracy theory is true. So every time Trump bombs Assad, they'll say, oh, Putin told them where to bomb. It didn't really do much. It didn't kill enough people for us to be convinced. Um, when Trump provides lethal aid to Ukraine, they'll say Putin told him to do that to throw everyone off the track. I honestly think that if tomorrow Trump bombed Moscow, they would say, oh, Putin told them which targets to bomb. Um, because it's become this religion that anybody who dissents from American political orthodoxy, anybody who challenges the Democratic Party, um, and Donald Trump himself are basically controlled by this mastermind that is straight out of a James Bond movie named Vladimir Putin. And it's really become a sickness in the West that is smearing the reputation of people like Jill Stein, but also justifying massive military budgets and all kinds of very dangerous geopolitical policies around the world. So let's get to some public questions. What can an average citizen do to avoid the invasion of his privacy? Well, the good news about that is, as I said earlier, first of all, there are actually now internet services, including Facebook and Google, that do use greater encryption that does provide genuine protections for your privacy. So a lot of times you're using encryption at, without even realizing it. Um, you know, to some extent, that was always the case. If you accessed your bank account, if you bought a, a plane ticket, you were using encrypted websites just by default. Um, and that has become true now. If you pick up your telephone and message someone on WhatsApp or other services, um, then you're automatically protected by encryption. But there are still steps you can take beyond that that have become increasingly less difficult. Um, there are uh, telephone apps such as um, Signal and, and Telegraph that allow a good deal of privacy protection. Um, there are ways to communicate and to browse the internet such as the Tor browser. There are encryption programs. Um, on email, you know, five years ago when I was first contacted by Edward Snowden, you had to be a very sophisticated um, and advanced uh, computer expert in order to use a lot of these programs. And I remember in 2015, Snowden in an interview said that the goal of the hacking community and the privacy community has to be to make these encryption tools meet the Glenn Greenwald standard, by which he means that basically any idiot has to be able to, to use them. And that is essentially what has happened. Um, increasingly, they're getting easier to use. And so every day, it's easier for you to build a wall between your own privacy and your private communications and what you do on the internet and the ability of governments and non-state actors uh, to be able to monitor what it is you're doing. And it's incumbent upon people whose jobs need security and safety and confidentiality, like doctors and journalists and human rights activists to use them, but especially, but, but also for ordinary citizens to just make it that much harder for governments around the world to use the internet as a spying tool. So the next question, how can we break through the corporate news domination of our country? In brackets, meaning USA. Well, I, you know, it's interesting, I think that, um, if you go back and look at some of the early commentary about the internet, why people were so excited about the, this incredible invention that really obviously is one of the most significant human innovations in centuries, one of the main reasons was that it would give human beings the power to disseminate information and communicate with one another without having to rely upon huge corporate institutions. And to some extent that has not happened in part because these corporate institutions now control and own the internet, as we were talking about before with Facebook and Google being so dominant, um, in part because of the, what made Edward Snowden come forward, which is the fact that governments around the world have turned the internet into this unprecedented means of coercion and control, as opposed to what the promise was, which is that it would be this unparalleled tool of liberation and democratization. But at the same time, it has actually empowered people around the world in ways that were previously unimaginable. I think the best example is the world's understanding of what Israel does do in Gaza. 10 years ago, when the Israelis would decide to just drop bombs indiscriminately on Gaza and slaughter civilians, they would allow only their favorite Western reporters working for large corporate media outlets into Gaza who would immediately recite the line of the IDF 
that they only killed Hamas or that they were bombing Hamas or if they had killed bombed the school, it was because Hamas had turned it into just lies, blatant lies. And that was the only way we could get our information was we had to rely upon the corporate media. Now, even a population purposely deprived, extremely poor, like Gazans, 1.8 million Gazans have cell phones and internet upload links. And so when the Israelis randomly shoot um, protesters who are unarmed or when they bomb schools, uh, we see the footage of the truth. And it has changed how people think of the relationship between the Israelis and the Palestinians. It's much harder for Israel to lie to the world because they can no longer control what we're seeing about their actions the way they could just even 10 or 15 years ago as a result of the internet. And that's why, to me, um, fighting to keep the internet free, not asking corporations and governments to censor and control it, remains the central fight. Um, because it does remain one of the most promising tools in human history for us to be able to organize together, to disseminate information, and to undermine and subvert the most powerful institutions. And the last thing we ought to be doing is asking those institutions to be increasing their control over the internet. And the last question, could you talk about the piece where you talk about homelessness and dogs in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro? What culture has developed out of that? Sure. I mean, this is a, a personal project for myself and, and my husband. Um, we've been rescuing dogs for uh, many years, and I think this is that we have 24 of our own. I think this is the first speech I've ever given from my house where they weren't barking. People are going to complain about that because they love my, my dog barking. Um, and about five years ago, we began focusing on the very substantial homeless population here in Rio uh, de Janeiro, which lives on the street very frequently with their pets and began noticing that the bond that forms between homeless people and their homeless animals is much more profound and much greater and much deeper than the average relationship of people who love their pets in large part because neither have anything else and they have only each other. And there's now amazing social science research on this, um, the proving that this is true. And so we recently decided we wanted to tap into that energy by building, developing a shelter that takes care of abandoned animals, but at the same time only employs homeless people who have lived on the streets um, and shown this love for animals. And so it's a project that's simultaneously caring for abandoned animals, but at the same time employing homeless people, helping them open bank accounts, um, teaching them how to rent an apartment and then get off the street and then find permanent employment. And it's a model that we hope to use around the world because it's helping two populations that typically are neglected, aband abandoned animals, and homeless people. And you know, I think it's very important that in your politics um, that you embrace important principles of humanitarianism and peace. But at the same time, I think it's very important that those not stay abstract, that you practice those principles in your life as well. Um, and the more we just find ways to spread those values just in small ways, um, the more the world will improve. And you know, I usually get asked at these kinds of uh, functions, like what is it that we can do to change these things? And for me, the answer is always for focus first on your own individual behavior and ask what you can be doing more of to make the world a better place. Glenn Greenwald, co-founder of The Intercept and investigative journalist, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. This round, we are going to attempt to find solution. We're not just talking about the political level. Part of it is the political level, but not just. We're talking about direct action. So I would like to introduce again, Jill Stein and Abby Martin on stage. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to start off with a quote that I think is a really good uh, way to begin this conversation. And it's from the late Howard Zinn, a bit of background on Howard Zinn. 
He is an historian who did a lot of work writing the People's History of the United States. That's the name of his book. And he did a lot of work on documenting the suppression and exploitation of uh, marginalized people. This includes women, blacks, uh, Hispanics. And he documents and provides another viewpoint of American history. So this quote I found particularly interesting uh, to start this conversation. And here it goes. Voting is easy and marginally useful, but it is a poor substitute for democracy, which requires direct action by concerned citizens. Jill, I want to start off with you, uh, since you're a politician. Do you think voting is the only solution? And if not, what other methods are available for citizens? I completely agree with Howard Zinn that voting is one thing that we do every two years or four years, but democracy is not just how you cast your vote. If, if that's all it was, it would be pretty hopeless. You know, uh, in my view, electoral politics is most powerful as a way to build the movements that we're working on all the time and which are the real drivers of social change. And, um, you know, I think fundamentally we want to build the movements that are really critical where we live in our communities for living wages, for the right to a job, for health care, to end student debt, to um, have uh, free public higher education, to end war, and to rescue the climate. All those things go together. And that's, you know, that's a big agenda, but you focus on what's really critical so that you can work with the people around you uh, and build an unstoppable force for change. Abby? I think voting is literally the least thing that you can do. Um, and that's, you know, I agree with Jill. <laughs> for people who don't vote, I, I feel bad because it just takes almost no effort to just go cast your ballot. I mean, I understand why people feel completely disenfranchised. Like Jill was saying, 40% of Americans were non-votes, and most of those people are people of color and, and working class or poor people. And that shows you how disenfranchised they are from this two-party dictatorship that just completely does not address any of their needs. So I get it, but it's time that we really start reaching out and building movements with those people um, who are outside of that system. Well, I'll comment on that as well, because starting activism in Munich was a very difficult thing to do. It's not that easy. Uh, when you see all these banners and these lights and people getting to this point, even this point is not the end point, but anyways, getting to it any was a very difficult thing because the big questions that came around was you have to, when you begin a movement or you begin an organization, there's a lot of energy, and I'm talking about not a capitalistic organization. I'm talking about an organization that is built on idealism, right? Mm -hmm. People have to find ways outside of work, outside of university. You have deadlines every day. Think about of a single mother, um, and outside of their jobs, to find ways to engage themselves. And that was the big thing that we had to do. So my uh, personal take would be, one has to organize their life and find discipline for it. And that doesn't mean you do it every day. It doesn't mean you do it every week. It means you find a time in the year and try to repeat that act. And this is how people like organizers, I organize a lot of the capacities within Activism Munich. This is how people like me can then coordinate those points. You know, there's a designer, oh cool, there's an editorial person, oh how can I get that editorial text on the design? You know, then people can start planning capacities. And doing that over a period of time, you start seeing something develop. It's like a flower bloom, you know? So that would be my little comment. Yeah, um, we all have our own creative capacities and we need to enrich each other, build each other up, keep e inspiring each other. But I totally agree with you, it's so easy to get burnt out. And a lot of people enter this movement and then they immediately leave it because they just go full force and, and their fire extinguishes itself, you know, because it's so difficult under capitalism. Um, it's such an oppressive system that you feel alone. And so I agree with you, the first step is reaching out to the community and then finding out what your strengths are and building on that. Yeah, and we had a lot of people that came in this organization, like a lot of them, and I, I'm so sad that they left. It's, it's not because they wanted to in the sense of, um, oh, this is a bad organization or something, but the system ate them up at some point. Mm -hmm. They had to travel somewhere, they had to find a job somewhere, and that created big holes in our organization. But like you said, Abby, if we find ways, if you have the energy, you will always find a way, in my opinion, to somehow uh, coordinate the ways and come over crisis. And I think the biggest challenge, and uh, uh, Jill, that's for you. 
like, tell me about the Green Party. How much intra-conflicts do you guys have? Is it like, uh, I mean, it's important that we share the emotional strategy, uh, conflicts that we might have within each other. And how do you go around that? So, you know, for me, um, the Green Party was kind of like finding a family because, um, you know, many of us are odd man out, you know, in, in railing against war and nuclear weapons and, you know, privatized healthcare. The system has so much propaganda, you know, it takes a certain kind of, you know, uh, fortitude to fight it. And so many of us feel very alone in that fight. And for me, the Green Party was where I could find lots of other people who were, who were fighting on exactly the same issues. And, and it was just so exhilarating to find this whole community of support and people who really wanted to do stuff about it, you know, and not just kind of scream about it and curse the stars, but really wanted to do active, practical stuff, come up with real solutions, challenge power, push the envelope. Um, you know, for me, it's been an incredible source of strength. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't lots of disagreements within the party. Uh, we're a very grassroots party, which means it doesn't have like a top-down authoritarian uh, style. So there's, it's, there's, there's just oodles of debate going on, but we move as a group. So, for example, the Green Party adopted uh, BDS, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, like 10 years ago. And we were kind of ahead of a lot of the popular understanding. So there was intense debate within the party that went on for years and we all educated each other. And we kind of, we, you know, we came along. And so, yeah, there's a lot of vigorous debate, but, um, you know, Sharing an agenda for people, planet, and peace over profit is kind of the unifying thing, and the unifying thing is activism. So for me, uh, you know, it's really been a great um, kind of moral compass and a guide to where we're going. So let's uh, jump onto some public questions. Uh, ich habe folgende Frage an Jill Stein. How is the Green Party developing on the local level? So that's really where the focus of the Green Party is. We get most attention at the presidential level, unfortunately. I mean, and that's not very much either. Um, but our real focus as a party is, is locally, and that's where we have a lot of local elected officials and where we're fighting, you know, on, on energy systems to get public transportation, you know, for free public higher education. These battles are always local, and that's where we're most persuasive and where we really build community. So it's going really well in spite of the fear-mongering that's going on, whether it's Russia or Donald Trump. You know, there's a lot of fear, and the Green Party is made to, you know, is being made out to be the enemy, you know, public enemy number one, Russian talking points, uh, collaborating with Putin, etc. You know, all this nonsense. Um, in spite of that, we're doing really well, <laughs> and we're growing. We have a wonderful crop of local candidates, lots of uh, candidates of color, uh, immigrant, uh, Latino, Muslim, and it makes me really be very proud to be a part of a party which is about frontline communities and which is helping to lift up those struggles that are really leading the way to, you know, to a better community, country, and, and planet. Abby, I wanted to ask you something that specifically uh, concerns activism. A lot of people go in different routes. Some people are fighting for animal rights. Some people are fighting for GMOs. Some people are fighting for um, certain oppressed people around the world. What do you think activism should be like? Should it be more like issue specific? Or do you think it should always encompass something more uh, bigger than its own cause? Well, yeah, I mean, if you agree that capitalism is, is the structure that is breeding, you know, this rampant inequality, violent oppression and imperialism around the world, I absolutely think that the number one goal should be replacing that system, right? So we need to understand the context, like I was saying before, uh, be instructive of how we got here and how we can get out of it because, you know, it all stems from the same thing. So if you're fighting animal rights, you're always going to be in the US, there's, there's people who are basically facing felonies for exposing animal rights abuses because that's what the system does to you. That's how capitalism works. Because it, uh, it hurts the profit margins. Yeah, exactly. If you're exposing their uh, 
the way they treat animals, right? Exactly. So I think just, just keeping that in mind, I think everyone does have their passion. My passion is media and you know, um, anti-war activism. Um, but we can all use our own passions. If you're an artist, if you're a musician, if you're an author, like we were saying before, you can be creative. You can find creative ways to fight the system, to fight capitalism. There's people who are divesting all over the place, and this is something that you won't hear on the corporate media. Uh, Project Censored is a, an amazing um, outlet that I encourage anyone who's a, a prospective journalist to get involved in. They are incredibly instructive, and they help you kind of, you know, understand how to do journalism, but they publish a list of 25 censored stories every year. And this last year, um, some of the censored stories were successful divestment campaigns, divestment from police, divestment from big oil, divestment from weapons contractors. And so this is happening all over the country and people are taking initiatives um, upon themselves in communities, in college campuses, and that's where it needs to come from. Um, you're never gonna hear about it, because these successes are obviously stifled, but that's how we can be making a difference, a huge difference. See, this is the point I want to make about the media. I always tell people when they ask me, why, you, why are you so different from the corporate media? And I'm, I don't want to demonize the media in the sense that all journalists are evil. They're not, you know? Like, we are part of what we call the fourth estate, and we have to protect each other, even if I don't agree with their opinions. But one thing that definitely makes us different in this sense is their capitalist structure. They are a for-profit business. It would be akin to sending your child to school and you open the school book and there's advertisements of different companies within it. The information is coming probably from some big sponsor which also has an interest and uh, you are charging children based on profitability. You know, like I was in Pakistan, I grew up there. Uh, the pr educational system is privatized. So the classes were divided according to uh, how much money you have. The A class was always the rich ones, and you saw them, they were dressed differently. I was an F, right? And I was part of, in my class, there were a lot of people that came from the feudal background. And I was the back row also. If you're the back row, you're the poorest of the poor, which was not the case, I just couldn't speak English. So they assumed that um, I was from a poor background, right? So putting that into context, think about a school system which puts profits over children, which puts advertisement over the information, the content that you share. And then when people ask me, okay, what's the jump here? Then I say, hey, think about this part of the second. Uh, the education for people after you get out of school is the media. I mean, how do you inform yourself after that? And that system is a capitalist system, top down, profit, they're selling you to advertisers. That's what Noam Chomsky showed in his book. And so those are the things that people I don't think understand. And I want to make a last point on this before I jump to a public question is, Militarism is also connected with capitalism. As we got globalized on the international level, uh, you needed military bases to protect businesses and corporate interest. So I think in a sense what you guys are saying is true in its essence that we cannot fight any issue unless you put it into context. And I think th this is what I personally would advise people who are trying to pick up any cause. Put that into context and if it's not there then jump the organization because you're wasting time and as you said before we're running out of time. And it's not like uh, the world is going to be a better place uh, if we all start doing some small causes. I think it's going to be a better place if we put it into a system. I wanted to jump in there really quickly. And you hit it on the head, which is that that is the crux of empire. And I think that is also the crux of why we're fomenting this anti-Russian hysteria. Because ultimately, Russia is another giant capitalist entity, right, that is going to be ultimately a competitor with the United States. And we know that China is as well. And so fomenting that fear and hostility is an inevitability that we're going to confront these two giant economic powers in the future. And that's why empire continues to eat other countries around the globe. I mean, like I was saying before, you, you know who our friends and our foes are, and there's always something very similar with the foes, right? It's all the people or the countries that haven't bent to our economic hegemony. They're not subservient, they're not uh, slaves to the US empire. So we have to focus on those countries and install regime change, right, under the guise of humanitarianism. So it's very, very blatant and obvious. And I think, you know, we all feel alone. You feel like the corporate media is completely dominated. How can we ever break through? You don't realize that people are waking up. People do not trust the system. Bring it up to your friends, colleagues, coworkers, wear a button. I mean, anything that can start a dialogue and you, you, you'll you never really, you know, it's very surprising how many people that you can just interact with on a daily basis and start building those communications. Okay, let's jump to another public question. 
Um, also, at Jillstein, do you have any advice for young people on how to discover their purpose, talents in the professional field workplace? I feel like many teenagers have to decide it way too soon. Yes, definitely. And um, I grew up in a generation where it was okay. You know, ours was the anti-war generation. It was, you know, the uh, the generation that brought the troops home from Vietnam, that uh, was out in the street for the civil rights movement and also for the women's movement. So, uh, if at that moment of great sort of social uh, turmoil and turnover, it was okay to spend some time like sort of figuring out what your place in that was going to be. And I feel like now people are getting pigeonholed to be a cog in the wheels of this uh, vicious capitalist system that has created part-time, temporary, horrific jobs for people without any security, without any future, without any uh, growth to it. We shouldn't you know, feel like we have to accept that system. You know, the question is always, how do you survive while you are fighting that system? And, you know, I'd encourage people not only to find their, their connection, you know, and their passion and to try out a few different kinds of things. Don't be afraid of the arts and humanities, which are so disparaged nowadays. You're supposed to get a nice, secure niche in some very insecure <laughs> service industry job and, you know, pretend that that's going to be your future. You know, I think it's really important for us to recognize our future depends on each other. And as you find your niche, find it in a way that you can work as part of a bigger team. No one is being more screwed right now than the younger generation who is being provided really who's being denied a decent economy, who's being thrust into a climate which is uh, collapsing, and into a state of permanent war which is de devouring our resources that should be used for humanizing society and creating pathways forward for, for the younger generation. So young people have been thrown into this absurd, uh, cruel system and don't feel like you have to make sense of it because it cannot be made sense of. It really has to be fought. And the more we can fight together, the more we can live in, you know, uh, work in cooperatives or live in cooperative working situations. My friends, I must say, in the younger generation who have found that pathway have a much more, um, uh, a, a less steep mountain to climb because at least they feel like they have some collective form of security, their rent is more affordable, they cook together, they buy food together, um, you know, and those who are working in co-ops have a say over their working conditions. So I'd say just keep raising the bar and don't be afraid to raise the bar and don't be afraid to take your time to demand more of the system and to find a, uh, a workable pathway forward. So, Abby, I have a question for you. Should we take Trump tweets seriously, and if so, why? <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, it's hard not to pay attention because he's a complete lunatic and he, um, you know, uses Twitter as his personal soapbox, but I think the problem is too much focus on it. Obviously, we should be paying attention, but we also have to be paying attention to the evangelicals that he is... Um, maneuvering around the country, there's Fifth Circuit Court judges that are completely from like the 16th century um, that are now basically in positions of power that are going to be there for decades beyond Trump's term. So he, while he's kind of an internet troll um, and out there making, you know, making headline after headline and, and causing this kind of flurry of corporate news absurdity, um, Mike Pence, Betsy DeVos, Mike Pompeo, Jeff Sessions, they are radical, radical Christian evangelicals who, and we're talking about a group of people who have not had this much power forever. Um, you know, th there is 30% of America who, who compose of this group and they basically hitch their wagon to Trump because they knew that they can push all of this legislation through. So that's the scariest part to me. And I don't, you know, impeaching Trump is gonna give us Mike Pence who can't even be in a room with another woman who isn't his wife. So it's, it's a very disturbing situation where, you know, and it's, it's even funnier that they hitch their wagons to Donald Trump because of who he is. <laughs> you know that he's never read the Bible. Um, so yes, we should be paying attention to everything, but we have to be looking behind the scenes and see how dangerous the people he surrounded himself with are and what they are doing. 
And uh, another one from you, from Wolfgang. What are the main things that keep you from being discouraged and stay motivated? So you just have to keep going. It's, it's not easy. Like I said before, you're, you live, fight, and die on the margins. And you can't expect to have recognition. You're never going to be on TV. You're never going to be lauded in magazines because that's the work that we do. This is a, a completely violent, crazy system that we're living in that does not reward dissent. It ostracizes it, it demonizes it, and it vilifies it. That's very clear with the fact that Jill and I are in this intelligence report saying that this is why our country is the way it is. So you have to understand that, but that's not why you get into it. You get into it because it's not about you. It's about the world. It's about bigger than yourself. You know, you have to remove yourself from, from that perspective and understand that you are just one person. You can only do so much but the actions that you take can have such profound effects. And just the people that I've met here tonight, I am so inspired to just keep fighting based on like what, it's just really, it's amazing. It's amazing. So we have to keep inspiring each other. We have to keep uplifting each other's voices because um, it, that's all we can do. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jill, you made the point earlier about there's no polling. I'll take it a step further. What do you think about democratizing foreign policy? It's not a new idea. They're doing this in Switzerland. And I think there was a couple of votes that happened on arms trade that got uh, rejected. Uh, oh, no. The basic income, I believe, didn't go through. Uh, but what do you think about this idea of democratizing foreign policy? A comment on it before you answer it. Uh, Britain, US, France, all the people that attack Syria after the alleged chemical attack, None of them went through Congress or the House of Parliament. So is this a call for democratizing foreign policy? So let me say yes, but as we democratize foreign policy, we also have to democratize our media because the media is perfectly capable of drumming up war fever as in Iraq and Afghanistan and maybe not Libya, but there are so many conflicts which have been absolutely catastrophic where we have been misled basically by lies and, and deception from our intelligence agencies. You know, there was the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq which didn't exist. There were the incubator babies supposedly that were being <laughs> thrown onto the floor, you know, completely manufactured, ginned up um, lie. A uh, public relations campaign that created public support for the first uh, invasion of Iraq. So we need to democratize, I'd say, our economy, you know, our healthcare system. We need to be meeting public needs. And whether that's happening by way of, of uh, direct votes or by getting money out of politics so that we can actually elect um, representatives who are truly representing us. You know, I think the merits of those different systems can be debated, but right now we don't have a tool in the wheelhouse whatsoever. Democracy is really, um, it's, it's, it's a sham right now. It really doesn't exist. It's been occupied. It's been taken over by big money, by corporate media, uh, by the theft of our public airwaves, which should be made free for public use, including candidates, opposition candidates, that the public has a right to hear. Our debates should be opened. They should be run by a public interest debate commission, not by this um, commission on presidential debates, which is a private corporation owned by the Democratic and Republican parties. So I'd say, yes, democracy is the name of the game. And that must include an economy uh, which is run on behalf of the people, not the oligarchs or the investors. We need to democratize our economy so that it's actually working on behalf of working people. I would also like to comment on this because this organization, Activism Munich, is struggling with uh, implementing democracy at its core value, right? It's not because we don't want to, it's because the system, if you think of a square, right, and it's getting smaller and smaller, and one of those organ within within this piece of paper, there's a circle, and just imagine the square is getting smaller. At some point, the circle will also become a square, you know, if it gets smaller. And so we notice always that 
whatever happens, if somebody can't achieve his target or her target, right? Or we don't, it's always because, oh, my boss just called, I don't have a choice here, I gotta pay that, yeah? Or I have to work, I have friends that work at a bar, Steiner, hi. Um, and uh, I, I see them struggling. I see a lot of people struggling with university and stuff like that, and those people that join activism, I see that struggle in front of me. You know, I, in my own case, I had to go on unemployment benefits to make this idea happen, and today I'm employed at this organization, but I had to radically think about something to get out of the system to create a new idea. And I don't think, I'm not asking people to do that, you know, I'm not asking people to do that, but there are good initiatives that have started, right? Like your initiative, Media Roots, right? There are good initiatives. I ask people not to like five hours a week or day, 10 minutes a month. And if you add that up, it adds up to something. Like I never thought if somebody would have asked me, hey, you're gonna interview Edward Snowden and a presidential candidate then in five years from now, I would say, hey, are you crazy? Did you just smoke up or something, <laughs> right? Um, but that's what happened and I, I really encourage people, I, start, just small steps add up to a big collective change. And that's always, I think history has always proven that when changes did occur. And when you find those like minds, then those opportunities just come naturally, which is so beautiful. Yep. And Joe, I have a question for you. Will you run for president in the next election? <laughs> 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 So I'll just say um, that's a decision that actually gets made by voters. And um, you know, I'd say if if people have an idea in mind, you know, to get involved with your local Green Party, because at the end of the day, it's a decision of the Green Party. In my view, you know, I don't think of myself as a politician. I think of myself more as a mother on fire. And, <laughs> and every day I get up to fight the power because I know that my kids' lives, like all kids' lives, really depend on that. They do not have a future uh, on the pathway that we're on. And so that really keeps me on my feet. And I'm looking for any and every opportunity to uh, radically change the direction of our future. And I'm happy to play any role whatsoever. In some ways, I would be very interested in running for a winnable, office at the level of state legislature or potentially Congress. Um, you know, I think it's really important that all of us do whatever we can do uh, to help create this massive pressure for change. And what role, what any particular role <clears throat> we play at any time doesn't matter so much. It kind of depends on the circumstances that arise. And I'm perfectly willing to uh, go with the flow. I spent I hesitate to think how many years of my life training to be a medical doctor. And I then was a medical doctor for about 25 years. And then I transitioned from practicing clinical medicine to practicing political medicine because it's the mother of all illnesses and we have to change our politics if we're going to get out of here alive. So I've kind of, you know, run the gamut. And I'm really happy to be wherever circumstances dictate that, you know, that I can help make a difference. And, and I feel like that's the, that's the objective for all of us, is to find what we can do and to do it together. Abby? A question or a statement, let me see. Thank you for your work, Abby Martin, and your honesty. You are a weapon, you are weaponing us with <laughs> okay, you are weaponing weapon. us with information to act, but how do we, ah, okay, how do we bring this information across to people who don't know the, who don't know the facts, but argue that it's a conspiracy? I mean, that, that is the struggle, right, is, is breaking people out of the, that orthodoxy and that paradigm, and we have to just be a part of that paradigm shift. I think that once people see, you can't unsee. Mm -hmm. um, there is a conspiracy uh, that goes on every day. I mean, that's what Wall Street is. They conspire to <laughs> subjugate the masses with economic you know, policies. I mean, our government conspires every day. It's, it's kind of outlandish to just discard the notion of, of conspiracies on, on a grand scale when that's literally what 
um, you know, the oligarchs of the world are doing. But uh, so I think it's just, it, it's small steps. It's showing people the truth on what's going on in Palestine. I mean, it's, it's finding those narratives that are so regimented and hammered down our throats and picking one by one and kind of showing people that there's an alternative narrative, there's a counter um, narrative to these, to these truths, right? These ultimate truths that control our society and, and hammer us with dogma every day. And, and, you know, that when it comes to Americans that were, you know, American exceptionalism and all these notions that, that keep us in the positions that we're in. So it's little steps. It's showing people the truths, whether it be Palestine, whether it be Colombia, whether it be the U.S. empire, um, whether it be Germany. Um, every little step counts. Every little comment matters. Um, everything that you share really does make a difference, and so never think that it doesn't. I was speaking to someone earlier who was talking to me about publishing a socialist newspaper, and, and he was saying, you know, it's difficult. How do we get this out here? I can only pass out 10, whereas, you know, CNN has uh, capitalized on hundreds of millions of people. And it's like, people are distrusting that. At the more that the system oppresses people, the more you know, half the people are living in poverty. They can't make their paychecks every week. They know it's not working for them. They're looking for something else, but they just don't know where to find it. So you need to be that person that will show them another path. You need to be that person that shows them another truth, another narrative against this prevailing uh, crazy orthodoxy that we deal with every day. So everything makes a difference, and, and every paper that you hand out, you know, one out of 100, someone's going to join the movement, and they're going to be a fighter. And that's because of you. And you may not know, you may not be rewarded for it, but you have to know that everything has reverberations out there and you cannot stop because we need you. Yeah. I want to talk, uh, not talk, but I'm, I'll mention this word socialism. I think it's, is it still banned in the US, this word? <laughs> Not no, after no. Bernie, you know, no. Yeah, Bernie changed the matters. And when say people, yeah, socialist government control and stuff, and I say, wait a second, there is already so socialism in place. Yeah, there is already democracy in place, but it's for the very few. Think about it. These guys organize mm -hmm. themselves in lobbies. They try to influence policy through uh, money, which is they're trying to, and they have really regiment uh, democracy, dem democratic institutions within themselves. They decide, you know, they, they exclude, mm -hmm. and what they do through these institutions is they enable to themselves more freedom in decision-making processes at the cost of the majority. So we have democracy, we have free decision-making, but it's for a very small sector of our society, if you think about it that way. So the people on top enjoy democracy, I think, but only for themselves. You know, The moment you open up to, it, to more people, that's when this stuff comes. Yeah, socialism, government control. But if you think about it the other way, they love influencing policy. That's, they love decision-making processes, but only as long as it is in their own hands. So with that being said, um, what do you think, Jill, about forming networks here? Like DM25 is a progressive movement that started by Yanis Varoufakis. Yanis Varoufakis, I've interviewed him a couple of times, and uh, he started this movement after Greece got the hammer from the EU, austerity policies, the same thing that they did in Latin America. Uh, we don't need to go into the detailed history of that, but. Uh, and they try to stand up to the EU and speak their own language. He was demonized here in the media. Um, instead of having a dialogue, like you went to Russia, and I don't see a problem if you have a dialogue there. I mean, what else do we want to do? I remember when I was a kid and uh, me and my brother were having fights, my mom would say, go talk to your brother. You know, like, uh, not go in the different room and you, you guys will not. I mean, this Point is just, your weapons yeah, at each other. yeah, yeah, just this is basic elementary things. And you make the effort to go to Russia and have a dialogue, right? And what do they do? They accuse you of being a Russian stooge and whatever you have. So Yanis Varoufakis tried to change the system from within. It didn't work, and he started a progressive movement. And he said, I'm not going to just change Greece. I'm going to change all of Europe, right? So what do you think about forming networks within Europe and America, transatlantic networks? I'm not talking about the orthodox definition of transatlantic, but really with, within movements. Your comments? Absolutely. I think. If we allow ourselves to be talked out of movements, we're being talked out of our power. Movements, you know, inherently bring us together. And just as an aside, by the way, um, diplomacy inherently is about talking to people you have problems with. It's not about talking to your friends. And that's what we should be doing. And, uh, you know, it's outrageous to think 
that uh, people are saying the answer to our conflict with Russia is to shut down communications and to expel dip diplomats and to stop talking with each other. You know, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, what did they do? You know, John F. Kennedy opened doors, which was very controversial at the time. You know, uh, Russian missiles had been welcomed to Cuba following the Bay of Pigs, and Cuba feel, felt like it needed some protection. And so Russian missiles were on their way, and this was obviously very worrisome. And there were those who wanted to just fight back, you know, and to open up the nuclear war. And they proceeded with uh, dialogue and diplomacy, which worked. And, you know, eventually we got through the Cold War, and that should have been a time to have really advanced international law and human rights. At any rate, it, you know, we, we lost that opportunity, but we shouldn't lose focus on the fact that dialogue and diplomacy are absolutely essential. And when I went to Russia, if I could add, you know, my message there for this conference was uh, essentially that uh, we needed dialogue and diplomacy, not war, and that we needed a weapons embargo was, was our proposal for Syria. We needed a weapons embargo for Turkey to um, uh, stop allowing militias over its border uh, and for there to be a, a ceasefire. And I was actually very critical of Russia's new participation uh, in the Syrian war and the bombing which had just begun. So it's not like I went there with a kiss up message. You know, I went, I went there to actually have dialogue and diplomacy, which is what we need and that should be the model. And the, the German diplomat, Willy Wilmer, was there as well, right? That's right, yes, and he was the person at and the table. And nobody's accusing him of anything. Right, <laughs> he was the one person I was able to talk, at, <laughs> talk to at this table where the Russians all spoke Russian and nobody was introduced to anybody <laughs> or knew each other's names. So it's not as though there was any funny business going on at the the table that Putin only sat at briefly before he gave a speech in Russian. You know, so the whole thing is just so concocted. And by the way, all that happened eight months before it became a smear campaign. When did they start to care about it? When I got the nomination. When I got the nomination for the Green Party, all of a sudden it became, you know, the smear all over uh, social media. So, you know, this was really conjured up. And truth to tell, I'm kind of used to this <laughs> because I've been running for office ever since 2002. And they don't like it when people are running for office and they're actually telling the truth and, and, and holding power accountable. But to your question about forming broader alliances, that's really where the power is. The power is in building big movements. If we allow ourselves to be divided by national borders or by issue areas, we're divided and conquered. It's about having a big vision for people, planet, and peace over profit, or you can call it socialism, you know, call, or you can call it economic democracy, or you can call it do unto others and the golden rule. You know, Different people will use different words here, but I think the theme is the same, that we need to throw out the bums here, this economic elite that's absolutely you know, throwing us over the cliff, and we need to get together in order to do that. The minute we get together, we're absolutely unstoppable. So Abby, I'll leave you with the last words of inspiration. Don't stop. You have to keep fighting. Um, you know, the people that you meet in this world and in this movement make everything worth it. And like Zen and like Jill are saying, I mean, the system makes you feel so alone, right? It, this individualism, this neoliberal structure where you feel like you have to just, I don't know, work your ass off until you die and never really live a life. I mean, there's other creative things that you can do. And even if you have to work within the system somehow, you can always find some sort of outlet, give an hour of, of uh, your time a week. And that gives you something to live for. Again, it's not about us. It's not about the individual. It's about the greater good. And it's about saving the world, you guys. I mean, it's, it really is. And so if you have that internationalist perspective, um, it is what makes life worth living for. And the people that you meet will make it all worth it. So again, keep fighting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you guys for coming today. It was wonderful talking to you both, and I wish you guys 
a safe flight back. I'm pretty sure the CIA has stopped its rendition <laughs> problem, uh, pro uh, policies <laughs> good, good for the time being. <laughs> uh, the German government is a bit easy on this, so I wish you guys a flight back. Uh, happy flight back, and thank you guys for coming again. Thanks thank so much, you Zen. So much. You're incredible. You. Everyone get involved in yeah. activism Munich. Yeah. Woo. Thanks so much, you guys. Guys, uh, I just want to say an important message. Anybody who's on the way out, please stop for a second. Thank you for joining us today. In 2013, we had the idea of starting up an independent, non-profit, and bilingual media organization. A media outlet that is free of corporate and state interest, democratically organized by its members. We went on to implement this idea in 2014, and since then have produced 300 videos, reaching millions of people worldwide. We've also hosted major events that have included intellectuals such as Noam Chomsky, whistleblowers and Edward Snowden and investigative journalists such as Jeremy Skihill and Glenn Greenwald. We want to take this opportunity and show you our journey since the very beginning. Everything that you just saw was done largely by our volunteers on a democratic, non-profit basis. We don't even have our own equipment or our office. We've accomplished so much with so little by using the power of social media. However, we are unable to take the next step, which is to put it concretely, carry out our own investigations locally and internationally, providing daily news and analysis, and producing content beyond English and German. To realize these goals, we require your support on a monthly basis. Today, Activism is launching a campaign on Better Place to reach 1,000 donors that support us with little as 5 euros or 5 dollars a month. Meaningful change requires an educated and informed public. Your generosity can help make a difference. This movement, activism, it's a media movement. It, we don't shy away from conveying our opinion. We are open about it. You see that all the time. We are open. We let you judge 
well, if our opinions are right or wrong. We might be wrong in certain instances or right, but we are open and transparent. We're not like the corporate media. We're objective, but on the other side, siding for the Iraq war. We are open about, our poli about the policies we think, the changes we think that we need to implement. But more importantly, it's not about me as a person. I have to be very honest. This whole evening, I, my input was zero. I focused on moderating it, and I focused on coming on stage and making sure that all the information is vetted and approved and looked at and verified in a scientific way. That's why I want to call all my activists, all the volunteers of this organization, from translating, correction, design, to putting up uh, production, to uh, just being out there, uh, distributing the flyers. I want to call you guys all on the stage, all the team of activism, please come on stage. Reese. Come on, guys. Don't be stage fright. Put it on. Come on. Mike, Winnie, Valentina, Sarah, Miriam, Leonardo, Sasha, Clemens, Flo, Jill Abbey. Jonas, Chris, Lars, Thomas, Lucas, Marco, Nemo, come on, Daniel, Daniel. I want to thank you all for coming today. Don't forget to look at the info stands if you want to find an alternative to the system. I hope you have a good time. Make sure to donate on your way out. And thank you again. Bye-bye.